Eke Homo by Friedrich Nietzsche, translated by Anthony M. Ludovici. Translator's Introduction Eke Homo is the last prose work that Nietzsche wrote. It is true that the pamphlet Nietzsche contra Wagner was prepared a month later than the autobiography, but we cannot consider this pamphlet as anything more than a compilation, seeing that it consists entirely of aphorisms drawn from such previous works as Joyful Wisdom, Beyond Good and Evil, The Genealogy of Morals, etc. Coming at the end of a year, in which he had produced The Case of Wagner, The Twilight of the Idols, and The Antichrist, Eke Homo is not only a coping stone worthy of the wonderful creations of that year, but also a fitting conclusion to his whole life, in the form of a grand summing up of his character as a man, his purpose as a reformer, and his achievement as a thinker as if half-conscious of his approaching spiritual end, Nietzsche here bids his friends farewell, just in the manner in which, in The Twilight of the Idols, Aphorism 36, Part 9, he declares that everyone should be able to take leave of his circle of relatives and intimates when his time seems to have come, that is to say, while he is still himself while he still knows what he is about and is able to measure his own life and life in general and speak of both in a manner which is not vouchsafed to the groaning invalid to the man lying on his back decrepit and exhausted or to the moribund victim of some wasting disease nietzsche's spiritual death like his whole life, was in singular harmony with his doctrine. He died suddenly and proudly, sword in hand. War, which he, and he alone among all the philosophers of Christendom, had praised so wholeheartedly, at last struck him down in the full vigour of his manhood and left him a victim on the battlefield, the terrible battlefield of thought, on which there is no quarter, and for which no Geneva Convention has yet been established, or even thought of. To those who know Nietzsche's life work, no apology will be needed for the form and content of this wonderful work. They will know, at least, that a man either is or is not aware of his significance, and of the significance of what he has accomplished, and that if he is aware of it, then self-realization, even of the kind which we find in these pages, is neither morbid nor suspicious, but necessary and inevitable. Such chapter headings as Why I am so wise, Why I am a fatality, Why I write such excellent books, however much they may have disturbed the equanimity and objectivity in particular, of certain Nietzsche biographers, can be regarded as pathological only in a democratic age, in which people have lost all sense of gradation and rank, and in which the virtues of modesty and humility had to be preached far and wide as a corrective against the vulgar pretensions of thousands of wretched nobodies. For little people, can be endured only as modest citizens or humble Christians. If, however, they demand a like modesty on the part of the truly great, if they raise their voices against Nietzsche's lack of the very virtue they so abundantly possess, or pretend to possess, it is time to remind them of Goethe's famous remark, Nur die Lupen sind bescheiden. Only nobodies are ever modest. It took Nietzsche barely three weeks to write this story of his life. Begun on the 15th of October, 1888, his four and fortieth birthday, it was finished on the 4th of November of the same year. And, 
but for a few trifling modifications and additions, is just as Nietzsche left it. It was not published in Germany until the year 1908, eight years after Nietzsche's death. In a letter dated the 27th of December, 1888, addressed to the musical composer Fuchs, the author declares the object of the work to be to dispose of all discussion, doubt, and inquiry concerning his own personality, in order to leave the public mind free to consider merely the things for the sake of which he existed. Die Dinge der Entwingen ich darbin. And, true to his intention, Nietzsche's honesty in these pages is certainly one of the most remarkable features about them. From the first chapter, in which he frankly acknowledges the decadent elements within him, to the last page, whereon he characterizes his mission, his life task, and his achievement, by means of the one symbol, Dionysus versus Christ. Everything comes straight from the shoulder, without hesitation, without fear of consequences, and above all, without concealment. Only in one place does he appear to conceal something, and then he actually leads one to understand that he is doing so. It is in regard to Wagner, the greatest friend of his life. Who doubts, he says, that I, old artillery man that I am, would be able, if I liked, to point my heavy guns at Wagner? But he adds, everything decisive in this question I kept to myself. I have loved Wagner. Page 122. To point, as many have done, to the proximity of all Nietzsche's autumn work of the year 1888 to his breakdown at the beginning of 1889, and to argue that in all its main features it foretells the catastrophe that is imminent, seems a little too plausible, a little too obvious, and simple to require refutation. That Nietzsche really was in a state, which in medicine is known as euphoria, that is to say, that state of highest well-being and capacity, which often precedes a complete breakdown, cannot, I suppose, be questioned. For his style, his penetrating vision, and his vigour reach the zenith in the works written in this autumn of 1888. But the contention that the matter, the substance of these works, reveals any signs whatsoever of waning mental health, or as a certain French biographer has it, of an inability to hold himself and his judgments in check, is best contradicted by the internal evidence itself. To take just a few examples at random, examine the cold and calculating tone of self-analysis in chapter one of the present work. Consider the reserve and the restraint with which the idea in Aphorism 7 of that chapter is worked out, not to speak of the restraint and self-mastery in the idea itself, namely, to be one's enemy's equal. This is the first condition of an honourable duel. Where one despises, one cannot wage war. Where one commands, where one sees something beneath one, one ought not to wage war. My war tactics can be reduced to four principles. First, I attack only things that are triumphant. If necessary, I wait until they become triumphant. Secondly, I attack only those things against which I find no allies, against which I stand alone, against which I compromise nobody but myself. Thirdly, I never make personal attacks. I use a personality merely as a magnifying glass, by means of which I render a general but elusive and scarcely noticeable evil more apparent. Fourthly, I attack only those things from which all personal differences are excluded, in which any such thing as a background of disagreeable experiences is lacking. 
and now notice the gentleness with which in chapter two wagner the supposed mortal enemy and the supposed envied rival to nietzsche is treated are these the words and the thoughts of a man who has lost or who is losing control and even if we confine ourselves simply to the substance of this work and put the question is it a new nietzsche or the old nietzsche that we find in these pages is it the old countenance with which we are familiar or are the features distorted awry disfigured what will the answer be obviously there is no new or even deformed nietzsche here because he is still faithful to the position which he assumed in thus spake zarathustra five years previously and is perfectly conscious of this fidelity see page one four one neither can he be even on the verge of any marked change because the whole of the third chapter in which he reviews his life work is simply a reiteration and a confirmation of his old points of view which are here made all the more telling by additional arguments suggested no doubt by maturer thought in fact if anything at all is new in this work it is its cruel certainty its severe deliberateness and its extraordinarily incisive vision as shown for instance in the summing up of the genuine import of the third and fourth essays in the thoughts out of season pages seventy five to seventy six eighty eighty one and eighty two a summing up which a most critical analysis of the essays in question can but verify romanticism idealism christianity are still scorned and despised another outlook a nobler braver and more earthly outlook is still upheld and revered the great yea to life including all that it contains that is terrible and questionable is still pronounced in the teeth of pessimists nihilists anarchists christians and other decadents and germany europe's flatland is still subjected to the most relentless criticism if there are any signs of change besides those of mere growth in this work they certainly succeed in eluding the most careful search undertaken with a full knowledge of nietzsche's former opinions and it would be interesting to know precisely where they are found by those writers whom the titles of the chapters alone seem so radically to have perturbed but the most striking thing of all the miracle so to speak of this autobiography is the absence from it of that loathing that suggestion of surfeit with which a life such as the one nietzsche had led would have filled any other man even of power approximate to his own this anchorite who in the last years of his life as a healthy human being suffered the experience of seeing even his oldest friends including Roda, show the most complete indifference to his lot this wrestler with fate for whom recognition in the persons of branas tain and strindberg have come all too late and whom even support sympathy and help arriving as it did at last through doyson and from madame de salis marchla could no longer cheer or comfort this was the man who was able notwithstanding to inscribe the device amor fati upon his shield on the very eve of his final collapse as a victim of the unspeakable suffering he had endured and this final collapse might easily have been foreseen nietzsche's sensorium as his autobiography proves was probably the most delicate instrument ever possessed by a human being and with this fragile structure the prequisite by the by of all genius his terrible will compelled him to confront the most profound and most recondite problems 
we happen to know from another artist and profound thinker benjamin disraeli who himself had experienced a dangerous breakdown what the consequences precisely are of indulging in excessive activity in the sphere of the spirit more particularly when that spirit is highly organized disraeli says in contrarini fleming part four chapter five i have sometimes half believed although the suspicion is mortifying that there is only one step between his state who deeply indulges in imaginative meditation and insanity for i will remember that at this period of my life when i indulge in meditation to a degree that would now be impossible and i hope unnecessary my senses sometimes appear to be wandering and artists are the proper judges of artists not oxford dons like dr schiller who in his impudent attempt at dealing with something for which his pragmatic hands are not sufficiently delicate eagerly avails himself of popular help in his article on nietzsche in the eleventh edition of the encyclopaedia britannica and implies the hackneyed and wholly exploded belief that nietzsche's philosophy is madness in the making as german philosophers however are said to go to oxford only when they die we may perhaps conclude from this want of appreciation in that quarter how very much alive nietzsche's doctrine still is not that nietzsche went mad so soon but that he went mad so late is the wonder of wonders considering the extraordinary amount of work he did the great task of the transvaluation of all values which he actually accomplished and the fact that he endured such long years of solitude which to him the sensitive artist to whom friends were everything must have been a terrible hardship we can only wonder at his great health and can well believe his sister's account of the phenomenal longevity and bodily vigor of his ancestors no one however who is initiated no one who reads this work with understanding will be in need of this introductory note of mine for to all who know these pages must speak for themselves we are no longer in the nineteenth century we have learned many things since then and if caution is only one of these things at least it will prevent us from judging a book such as this one with all its apparent pontifical pride and surging self-reliance with undue haste or with that arrogant assurance with which the ignorance of the humble and the modest has always confronted everything truly great Anthony M. Ludovici End of Translator's Introduction Preface 1. As it is my intention within a very short time to confront my fellow men with the very greatest demand that has ever yet been made upon them, it seems to me above all necessary to declare here who and what I am. As a matter of fact, this ought to be pretty well known already, for I have not held my tongue about myself. But the disparity which obtains between the greatness of my task and the smallness of my contemporaries is revealed by the fact that people have neither heard me nor yet seen me. I live on my own self-made credit, and it is probably only a prejudice to suppose that I am alive at all. I do but require to speak to any one of the scholars who come to the Ober Engadine in the summer in order to convince myself that I am not alive. Under these circumstances, it is a duty, and one against which my customary reserve, and to still a greater degree, the pride of my instincts rebel to say, listen, for I am such and such a person, 
for heaven's sake do not confound me with anyone else two i am for instance in no wise a bogeyman or moral monster on the contrary i am the very opposite in nature to the kind of man that has been honoured hitherto as virtuous between ourselves it seems to me that this is precisely a matter on which i may feel proud i am a disciple of the philosopher dionysus and i would prefer to be even a satyr than a saint but just read this book maybe i have here succeeded in expressing this contrast in a cheerful and at the same time sympathetic manner maybe this is the only purpose of the present work the very last thing i should promise to accomplish would be to improve mankind i do not set up any new idols may old idols only learn what it costs to have legs of clay to overthrow idols idols is the name i give to all ideals is much more like my business in proportion as an ideal world has been falsely assumed reality has been robbed of its value its meaning and its truthfulness the true world and the apparent world in plain english the fictitious world and reality hitherto the lie of the ideal has been the curse of reality by means of it the very source of mankind's instincts has become mendacious and false so much so that those values have come to be worshipped which are the exact opposite of the ones which would ensure man's prosperity his future and his great right to a future three he who knows how to breathe in the air of my writings is conscious that it is the air of the heights that it is bracing a man must be built for it otherwise the chances are it will chill him the ice is near the loneliness is terrible but how serenely everything lies in the sunlight how freely one can breathe how much one feels lies beneath one philosophy as i have understood it hitherto is a voluntary retirement into regions of ice and mountain peaks the seeking out of everything strange and questionable in existence everything upon which hitherto morality has set its ban through long experience derived from such wanderings in forbidden country i acquired an opinion very different from that which may seem generally desirable of the causes which hitherto have led to men's moralizing and idealizing the secret history of philosophers the psychology of their great names was revealed to me how much truth can a certain mind endure how much truth can it dare these questions became for me ever more and more the actual test of values error the belief in the ideal is not blindness error is cowardice every conquest every step forward in knowledge is the outcome of courage of hardness towards oneself of cleanliness towards oneself I do not refute ideals. All I do is to draw on my gloves in their presence. Nitimur in vetitum. With this device, my philosophy will one day be victorious. For that which has hitherto been most stringently forbidden is, without exception, truth. 4. In my life work, my Zarathustra holds a place apart. With it, I gave my fellow men the greatest gift that has ever been bestowed upon them. This book, the voice of which speaks out across the ages, is not only the loftiest book on earth, literally the book of mountain air. The whole phenomenon, mankind, 
lies at an incalculable distance beneath it. But it is also the deepest book, born of the inmost abundance of truth, an inexhaustible well into which no pitcher can be lowered without coming up again laden with gold and with goodness. Here it is not a prophet who speaks, one of those gruesome hybrids of sickness and will to power, who men called founders of religion. If a man would not do a sad wrong to his wisdom, he must above all give proper heed to the tones, the halcyonic tones, that fall from the lips of Zarathustra. The most silent words are harbingers of the storm. Thoughts that come on doves' feet lead the world. The figs fall from the trees, they are good and sweet, and when they fall their red skins are rent. A north wind am I unto ripe figs. Thus like figs do these precepts drop down to you, my friends. Now drink their juice and their sweet pulp. It is autumn all around, and clear sky and afternoon. No fanatic speaks to you here. This is not a sermon. No faith is demanded in these pages. From out an infinite treasure of light and well of joy, drop by drop, my words fall out. A slow and gentle gait is the cadence of these discourses. Such things can reach only the most elect. It is a rare privilege to be a listener here. Not everyone who likes can have ears to hear Zarathustra. Is not Zarathustra, because of these things, a seducer? But what, indeed, does he himself say when for the first time he goes back to his solitude? Just the reverse of that which any sage, saint, saviour of the world, and other decadent would say. Not only his words, but he himself is other than they. Alone do I now go, my disciples. Get ye also hence, and alone, thus would I have it. Verily I beseech you, take your leave of me, and arm yourselves against Zarathustra, and better still, be ashamed of him. Maybe he hath deceived you. The knight of knowledge must be able not only to love his enemies, but also to hate his friends. The man who remaineth a pupil requiteth his teacher but ill. And why would ye not pluck at my wreath? Ye honour me. But what if your reverence should one day break down? Take heed, lest a statue crush you. Ye say ye believe in Zarathustra? But of what account is Zarathustra. Ye are my believers, but of what account are all believers? Ye had not sought yourselves when ye found me. Thus do all believers. Therefore is all believing worth so little. Now I bid you lose me and find yourselves, and only when you have all denied me will I come back unto you. Friedrich Nietzsche On this perfect day, when everything is ripening, and not only the grapes are getting brown, a ray of sunshine has fallen on my life. I looked behind me, I looked before me, and never have I seen so many good things all at once. Not in vain have I buried my four and fortieth year today. I had the right to bury it. That in it which still had life has been saved and is immortal. The first book of the Transvaluation of All Values, the Songs of Zarathustra, the Twilight of the Idols, my attempt to philosophize with a hammer, all these things are the gift of this year and even of his last quarter. How could I help being thankful to the whole of my life? That is why I am now going to tell myself the story of my life.
End of preface. Chapter One of Ecce Homo by Friedrich Nietzsche, translated by Anthony M. Ludovici. Ecce Homo, how one becomes what one is, why I am so wise. One. The happiness of my existence, its unique character, perhaps consists in its faithfulness. To speak in a riddle, as my own father. I am already dead, as my own mother I still live and grow old. This double origin, taken as it were from the highest and lowest rungs of the ladder of life, at once a decadent and a beginning, this, if anything, explains that neutrality, that freedom from partisanship in regard to the general problem of existence which perhaps distinguishes me. To the first indications of ascending or of descending life, my nostrils are more sensitive than those of any man that has yet lived. In this domain I am a master to my backbone. I know both sides, for I am both sides. My father died in his sixth and thirtieth year. He was delicate, lovable, and morbid, like one who is preordained to pay simply a flying visit, a gracious reminder of life rather than life itself. In the same year that his life declined, mine also declined. In my six-and-thirtieth year I reached the lowest point of my vitality. I still lived but my eyes could distinguish nothing that lay three paces away from me. At that time, it was the year 1879, I resigned my professorship at Vale, lived through the summer like a shadow in St. Moritz, and spent the following winter, the most sunless of my life, like a shadow in Naumburg. This was my lowest ebb. During this period I wrote The Wanderer, and his shadow. Without a doubt, I was conversant with shadows then. The winter that followed, my first winter in Genoa, brought forth that sweetness and spirituality which is almost inseparable from extreme poverty of blood and muscle, in the shape of the dawn of day. The perfect lucidity and cheerfulness the intellectual exuberance even that this work reflects coincides in my case not only with the most profound physiological weakness but also with an excess of suffering in the midst of the agony of a headache which lasted three days accompanied by violent nausea i was possessed of most singular dialectical clearness and in absolutely cold blood I then thought out things for which, in my more healthy moments, I am not enough of a climber, not sufficiently subtle, not sufficiently cold. My readers, perhaps, know to what extent I consider dialectic a symptom of decadence. As, for instance, in the most famous of all cases, the case of Socrates, all the morbid disturbances of the intellect, even the semi-stupor which accompanies fever, have, unto this day, remained completely unknown to me. And from my first information concerning their nature and frequency, I was obliged to have recourse to the learned works which have been compiled on the subject. My circulation is slow. No one has ever been able to detect fever in me. A doctor who treated me for some time as a nerve patient finally declared, No, there is nothing wrong with your nerves. It is simply I who am nervous. It has been absolutely impossible to ascertain any local degeneration in me, nor any organic stomach trouble. However much I may have suffered from profound weakness of the gastric system as the result of general exhaustion, even my eye trouble, 
which sometimes approached so parlously near to blindness, was only an effect and not a cause. For whenever my general vital condition improved, my power of vision also increased. Having admitted all this, do I need to say that I am experienced in questions of decadence? I know them inside and out. Even that filigree art of prehension and comprehension in general, that feeling for delicate shades of difference, that psychology of seeing through brick walls, and whatever else I may be able to do, was first learnt then and is the specific gift of that period during which everything in me was subtilized. Observation itself, together with all the organs of observation. To look upon healthier concepts and values from the standpoint of the sick, and conversely, to look down upon the secret work of the instincts of decadence from the standpoint of him who is laden and self-reliant with the richness of life. This has been my longest exercise, my principal experience. If in anything at all, it was in this that I became a master. Today my hand knows the trick. I now have the knack of reversing perspectives. The first reason, perhaps, why a transvaluation of all values has been possible to me alone. 2. For, apart from the fact that I am a decadent, I am also the reverse of such a creature. Among other things, my proof of this is that I always instinctively select the proper remedy when my spiritual or bodily health is low whereas the decadent, as such, invariably chooses those remedies which are bad for him. As a whole I was sound, but in certain details I was a decadent. That energy with which I sentenced myself to absolute solitude, and to a severance from all those conditions in life to which I had grown accustomed, my discipline of myself, and my refusal to allow myself to be pampered, to be tended hand and foot, and to be doctored, all this betrays the absolute certainty of my instincts, respecting what, at the time, was most needful to me. I placed myself in my own hands, I restored myself to health. The first condition of success in such an undertaking as every physiologist will admit, is that at bottom a man should be sound. An intrinsically morbid nature cannot become healthy. On the other hand, to an intrinsically sound nature, illness may even constitute a powerful stimulus to life, to a surplus of life. It is in this light that I now regard the long period of illness that I endured. It seemed as if I had discovered life afresh, my own self included. I tasted all good things, and even trifles, in a way in which it was not easy for others to taste them. Out of my will to health, and to life, I made my philosophy. For this should be thoroughly understood. It was during those years in which my vitality reached its lowest point that I ceased from being a pessimist. The instinct of self-recovery forbade my holding to a philosophy of poverty and desperation. Now by what signs are nature's lucky strokes recognized among men? They are recognized by the fact that any such lucky stroke gladdens our senses that he is carved from one integral block, which is hard, sweet, and fragrant as well. He enjoys that only which is good for him, his pleasure, his desire, ceases when the limits of that which is good for him are overstepped. He divines remedies for injuries, he knows how to turn serious accidents to his own advantage, that which does not kill him makes him stronger. 
he instinctively gathers his material from all he sees hears and experiences he is a selective principle he rejects much he is always in his own company whether his intercourse be with books with men or with natural scenery he honours the things he chooses the things he acknowledges the things he trusts he reacts slowly to all kinds of stimuli with that tardiness which long caution and deliberate pride have bred in him he tests the approaching stimulus he would not dream of meeting it halfway he believes neither in ill luck nor guilt he can digest himself and others he knows how to forget he is strong enough to make everything turn to his own advantage lo then i am the very reverse of a decadent for he whom i have just described is none other than myself three this double thread of experiences this means of access to two worlds that seem so far asunder finds in every detail its counterpart in my own nature i am my own complement i have a second sight as well as a first <laughs> and perhaps i also have a third sight by the very nature of my origin i was allowed an outlook beyond all merely local merely national and limited horizons it required no effort on my part to be a good european on the other hand i am perhaps more german than modern germans mere imperial germans can hope to be i the last anti-political german be this as it may my ancestors were polish noblemen it is owing to them that i have so much race instinct in my blood who knows perhaps even the liberum vito translator's footnote the right which every polish deputy whether a great or an inferior nobleman possessed of forbidding the passing of any measure by the diet was called in poland the liberum veto in polish nai posvalum and brought all legislation to a standstill End translator's note when i think of the number of times in my travels that i have been accosted as a pole even by poles themselves and how seldom i have been taken for a german it seems to me as if i belonged to those only who have a sprinkling of german in them but my mother franziska ochler is at any rate something very german as is also my paternal grandmother ermuth kraus the latter spent the whole of her youth in good old weimar not without coming into contact with Goethe's circle. Her brother, Krauss, the professor of theology in Konigsberg, was called to the post of general superintendent at Weimar after Herder's death. It is not unlikely that her mother, my great-grandmother, is mentioned in young Goethe's diary under the name of Merthgen. She married twice, and her second husband was Superintendent Nietzsche of Ellenburg. In 1813, the year of the Great War, when Napoleon, with his general staff, entered Ellenburg on the 10th of October, she gave birth to a son. As a daughter of Saxony, she was a great admirer of Napoleon, and maybe I am so still. My father born in 1813 died in 1849 previous to taking over the pastorship of the parish of rocken not far from lutzen he lived for some years at the castle of altenburg where he had charge of the education of the four princesses his pupils are the queen of hanover the grand duchess constantine the grand duchess of oldenburg and the Princess Theresa of Saxe Altenburg. He was full of royal respect for the Prussian king, Frederick William the Fourth, from whom he obtained his living at Rocken. 
The events of 1848 saddened him extremely. As I was born on the 15th of October, the birthday of the king above mentioned, I naturally received the Hohenzollern names of Frederick William. There was, at all events, one advantage in the choice of this day. My birthday throughout the whole of my childhood was a day of public rejoicing. I regard it as a great privilege to have had such a father. It even seems to me that this embraces all that I can claim in the matter of privileges. Life. The great yea to life, except it. What I owe to him, above all, is this, that I do not need any special intention, but merely a little patience, in order involuntarily to enter a world of higher and more delicate things. There I am at home, there alone does my inmost passion become free. The fact that I have had to pay for this privilege almost with my life certainly does not make it a bad bargain. In order to understand even a little of my Zarathustra, perhaps a man must be situated and constituted very much as I am myself, with one foot beyond the realm of the living. 4. I have never understood the art of arousing ill-feeling against myself. This is also something for which I have to thank my incomparable father, even when it seemed to him highly desirable to do so. However unchristian it may seem, I do not even bear any ill-feeling towards myself. Turn my life about as you may, you will find but seldom, perhaps indeed only once, any trace of someone's having shown me ill-will. You might perhaps discover, however, too many traces of goodwill. My experiences, even with those on whom every other man has burnt his fingers, speak without exception in their favour. I tame every bear. I can even make clowns behave decently. During the seven years in which I taught Greek to the sixth form of the college in Bala, I never had occasion to administer a punishment. The laziest youths were diligent in my class. The unexpected has always found me equal to it. I must be unprepared in order to keep my self-command. Whatever the instrument was, even if it were as out of tune as the instrument man can possibly be, it was only when I was ill that I could not succeed in making it express something that was worth hearing. And how often have I not been told by the instruments themselves that they have never heard their voices express such beautiful things? This was said to me most delightfully, perhaps, by that young fellow, Heinrich von Stein, who died at such an unpardonably early age and who, after having considerately asked leave to do so, once appeared in Sils Maria for a three days sojourn, telling everybody there that it was not for the Engadine that he had come. This excellent person, who with all the impetuous simplicity of a young Prussian nobleman had waded deep into the swamp of Wagnerism, and into that of Deringism, into the bargain. Translator's footnote. Eugène During is a philosopher and political economist, whose general doctrine might be characterized as a sort of abstract materialism with an optimistic colouring. End translator's note. Seemed almost transformed during these three days by a hurricane of freedom, like one who has been suddenly raised to his full height and given wings. Again and again I said to him that this was all owing to the splendid air. Everybody felt the same. One could not stand six thousand feet above Byrite for nothing. But he would not believe me. Be this as it may, if I had been the victim of many a small or even great offence, it was not will, and least of all, 
ill will that actuated the offenders, but rather, as I have already suggested, it was good will, the cause of no small amount of mischief in my life about which I had to complain. My experience gave me a right to feel suspicious in regard to all so-called unselfish instincts, in regard to the whole of neighbourly love, which is ever ready and waiting with deeds or with advice. To me, it seems that these instincts are a sign of weakness, that they are an example of the inability to withstand a stimulus. It is only among decadents that this pity is called a virtue. What I reproach the pitiful with is that they are too ready to forget shame, reverence, and the delicacy of feeling which knows how to keep at a distance. They do not remember that this gushing pity stinks of the mob, and that it is next of kin to bad manners, that pitiful hands may be thrust with results fatally destructive into a great destiny, into a lonely and wounded retirement, and into the privileges with which great guilt endows one. The overcoming of pity I reckon among the noble virtues. In the Temptation of Zarathustra I have imagined a case in which a great cry of distress reaches his ears, in which pity swoops down upon him like a last sin, and would make him break faith with himself, to remain one's own master in such circumstances, to keep the sublimity of one's mission pure in such cases, pure from the many ignoble and more short-sighted impulses which come into play in so-called unselfish actions. This is the rub, the last test, perhaps, which a Zarathustra has to undergo, the actual proof of his power. 5. In yet another respect, I am no more than my father over again, and, as it were, the continuation of his life after an all-too-early death. Like every man who has ever been able to meet his equal, and unto whom the concept retaliation is just as incomprehensible as the notion of equal rights, I have forbidden myself the use of any sort of measure of security or protection, and also, of course, of defence and justification. In all cases in which I have been made the victim either of trifling or even very great foolishness, my form of retaliation consists in this. As soon as possible, I set a piece of cleverness at the heels of an act of stupidity. By this means, perhaps, it may still be possible to overtake it. To speak in a parable, I dispatch a pot of jam in order to get rid of a bitter experience. Let anybody give me offence, I shall retaliate. He can be quite sure of that. Before long, I discover an opportunity of expressing my thanks to the offender, among other things even for the offence, or of asking him for something, which can be more courteous even than giving. It also seems to me that the rudest word, the rudest letter, is more good-natured, more straightforward than silence. Those who keep silent are almost always lacking in subtlety and refinement of heart. Silence is an objection. To swallow a grievance must necessarily produce a bad temper. It even upsets the stomach. All silent people are dyspeptic. You perceive that I should not like to see rudeness undervalued. It is by far the most humane form of contradiction. And, in the midst of modern effeminacy, it is one of our first virtues. If one is sufficiently rich for it, it may even be a joy to be wrong. If a god were to descend to this earth, he would have to do nothing but wrong, to take guilt, not punishment on one's shoulders, is the first proof of divinity. 
6. Freedom from resentment and the understanding of the nature of resentment. Who knows how very much, after all, I am indebted to my long illness for these two things. The problem is not exactly simple. A man must have experienced both through his strength and through his weakness. If illness and weakness are to be charged with anything at all, it is with the fact that when they prevail, the very instinct of recovery, which is the instinct of defence and of war in man, becomes decayed. He knows not how to get rid of anything, how to come to terms with anything, and how to cast anything behind him. Everything wounds him. People and things draw importunately near. All experiences strike deep. Memory is a gathering wound. To be ill is a sort of resentment in itself. Against this resentment, the invalid has only one great remedy. I call it Russian fatalism. That fatalism which is free from revolt, and with which the Russian soldier, to whom a campaign proves unbearable, ultimately lays himself down in the snow. To accept nothing more, to undertake nothing more, to absorb nothing more, to cease entirely from reacting. The tremendous sagacity of this fatalism, which does not always imply merely the courage for death, but which, in the most dangerous cases, may actually constitute a self-preservative measure, amounts to a reduction of activity in the vital functions, the slackening down of which is like a sort of will to hibernate. A few steps further in this direction we find the fakir, who will sleep for weeks in a tomb. Owing to the fact that one would be used up too quickly if one reacted, one no longer reacts at all. This is the principle. And nothing on earth consumes a man more quickly than the passion of resentment, mortification, morbid susceptibility, the inability to wreak revenge, the desire and thirst for revenge, the concoction of every sort of poison. This is surely the most injurious manner of reacting which could possibly be conceived by exhausted men. It involves a rapid wasting away of nervous energy, an abnormal increase of detrimental secretions, as for instance that of bile into the stomach. To the sick man, resentment ought to be more strictly forbidden than anything else. It is his special danger. Unfortunately, however, it is also his most natural propensity. This was fully grasped by that profound psychologist, Buddha. His religion, which it would be better to call a system of hygiene, in order to avoid confounding it with a creed so wretched as Christianity, depended for its effect upon the triumph over a sentiment. To make the soul free therefrom was considered the first step towards recovery. Not through hostility is hostility put to flight. Through friendship does hostility end. This stands at the beginning of Buddha's teaching. This is not a precept of morality, but of psychology. Resentment born of weakness is not more deleterious to anybody than it is to the weak man himself. Conversely, in the case of that man whose nature is fundamentally a rich one, resentment is a superfluous feeling, a feeling to remain master of which is almost a proof of riches. Those of my readers who know the earnestness with which my philosophy wages war against the feelings of revenge and rancor, even to the extent of attacking the doctrine of free will, 
My conflict with Christianity is only a particular instance of it. Will understand why I wish to focus attention upon my own personal attitude, and the certainty of my practical instincts precisely in this matter. In my moments of decadence, I forbade myself the indulgence of the above feelings, because they were harmful. As soon as my life recovered enough riches and pride, however, I regarded them again as forbidden, but this time because they were beneath me. That Russian fatalism, of which I have spoken, manifested itself in me in such a way that for years I hailed tenaciously to almost insufferable conditions, places, habitations, and companions. Once chance had placed them on my path, it was better than changing them, than feeling that they could be changed, than revolting against them. He who stirred me from this fatalism, he who violently tried to shake me into consciousness, seemed to me then a mortal enemy. In point of fact, there was danger of death each time this was done. To regard oneself as a destiny, not to wish oneself different. This, in such circumstances, is sagacity itself. 7. War, on the other hand, is something different. At heart I am a warrior. Attacking belongs to my instincts. To be able to be an enemy, to be an enemy, maybe these things presuppose a strong nature. In any case, all strong natures involve these things. Such natures need resistance. Consequently, they go in search of obstacles. The pathos of aggression belongs of necessity to strength as much as the feelings of revenge and of rancor belongs to weakness. Woman, for instance, is revengeful. Her weakness involves this passion, just as it involves a susceptibility in the presence of other people's suffering. The strength of the aggressor can be measured by the opposition which he needs. Every increase of growth betrays itself by seeking out of more formidable opponents or problems. For a philosopher who is combative challenges even problems to a duel. The task is not to overcome opponents in general, but only those opponents against whom one has to summon up all one's strength, one's skill, and one's swordsmanship. In fact, opponents who are one's equals. To be one's enemy's equal, this is the first condition of an honourable duel. When one despises, one cannot wage war. Where one commands, where one sees something beneath one, one ought not to wage war. My war tactics can be reduced to four principles. First, I attack only things that are triumphant. If necessary, I wait until they become triumphant. Secondly, I attack only those things against which I find no allies, against which I stand alone, against which I compromise nobody but myself. I have not yet taken one single step before the public eye which did not compromise me. That is my criterion of a proper mode of action. Thirdly, I never make personal attacks. I use a personality merely as a magnifying glass, by means of which I render a general but elusive and scarcely noticeable evil more apparent. In this way I attacked David Strauss, or rather the success given to a senile book by the cultured classes of Germany. By this means I caught German culture red-handed. In this way I attacked Wagner, or rather the falsity or mongrel instincts of our culture, 
which confounds the super-refined with the strong, and the effete with the great. Fourthly, I attack only those things from which all personal differences are excluded, in which any such thing as a background of disagreeable experiences is lacking. On the contrary, attacking is to me a proof of goodwill, and, in certain circumstances, of gratitude. By means of it, I do honour to a thing, I distinguish a thing, whether I associate my name with that of an institution or a person, by being against or for either, is all the same to me. If I wage war against Christianity, I feel justified in doing so because in that quarter I have met with no fatal experiences and difficulties. The most earnest Christians have always been kindly disposed to me. I, personally, the most essential opponent of Christianity, am far from holding the individual responsible for what is the fatality of long ages. 8. May I be allowed to hazard a suggestion concerning one last trait in my character, which in my intercourse with other men has led me into some difficulties? I am gifted with a sense of cleanliness, the keenness of which is phenomenal, so much so that I can ascertain physiologically, that is to say, smell, the proximity nay, the innermost core, the entrails of every human soul. This sensitiveness of mine is furnished with psychological antennae, wherewith I feel and grasp every secret, the quality of concealed filth lying at the base of many a human character, which may be the inevitable outcome of base blood, and which education may have veneered is revealed to me at the first glance. If my observation has been correct, such people, whom my sense of cleanliness rejects, also become conscious, on their part, of the cautiousness to which my loathing prompts me, and this does not make them any more fragrant. In keeping with the custom, which I have long observed, pure habits and honesty towards myself are among the first conditions of my existence. I would die in unclean surroundings. I swim, bathe, and splash about, as it were, incessantly in water, in any kind of perfectly transparent and shining element. That is why my relations with my fellows try my patience to no small extent. My humanity does not consist in the fact that I can understand the feelings of my fellows, but that I can endure to understand. My humanity is a perpetual process of self-mastery, but I need solitude, that is to say, recovery, return to myself, the breathing of free, crisp, bracing air. The whole of my Zarathustra is a diathram in honour of solitude, or, if I have been understood, in honour of purity. Thank heaven, it is not in honour of pure foolery. Translator's note. This, of course, is a reference to Wagner's Parseval. See my note on page 96 of The Will to Power, volume 1. End translator's note. He who has an eye for colour will call him a diamond. The loathing of mankind, of the rabble, was always my greatest danger. Would you hearken to the words spoken by Zarathustra concerning deliverance from loathing? What forsooth hath come unto me? How did I deliver myself from loathing? Who hath made my eye younger? How did I soar to the height where there are no more rabble sitting about the well? Did my very loathing forge me wings and the strength to send fountains far off? Verily, 
to the loftiest heights did I need to fly, to find once more the spring of joyfulness. Oh, I have found it, my brethren, up here, on the loftiest height, the spring of joyfulness gusheth forth for me, and there is a life at the well of which no rabble can drink with you. Almost too fiercely doth thou rush for me, thou spring of joyfulness, and oft times dost thou empty the pitcher again in trying to fill it. And yet I must learn to draw near thee more humbly, far too eagerly doth my heart jump to meet thee. My heart, whereon my summer burneth, my short, hot, melancholy, over-blessed summer, how my summer heart yearneth for thy coolness. Farewell the lingering afflictions of my spring, past is the wickedness of my snowflakes in June. Summer have I become entirely, and summer noontide, a summer in the loftiest heights, with cold springs and blessed stillness. O oh, come, my friends, that the stillness may wax even more blessed, for this is our height and our home. Too high and steep is our dwelling for all the unclean and their appetites. Do but cast your pure eyes into the well of my joyfulness, my friends. How could it thus become muddy? It will laugh back at you with its purity. On the tree called Future do we build our nest. Eagles shall bring food in their beaks unto us lonely ones. Verily, not the food whereof the unclean might partake. They would think they ate fire and would burn their mouths. Verily, no abodes for the unclean do we here hold in readiness. To their bodies our happiness would seem an ice cavern, and to their spirits also. And like strong winds will we live above them, neighbours to the eagles, companions of the snow, and playmates of the sun, thus do strong winds live. And like a wind shall I one day blow amidst them, and take away their soul's breath with my spirit, thus my future willeth. Verily, a strong wind is Zarathustra to all low lands, and this is his counsel to his foes and to all who spit and spew. Beware of spitting against the wind! End of Why I Am So Wise Chapter 2 of Ecce Homo by Friedrich Nietzsche Translated by Anthony M. Ludovici Why I Am So Clever 1. Why do I know more things than other people? Why, in fact, am I so clever? I have never pondered over questions that are not questions. I have never squandered my strength. Of actual religious difficulties, for instance, I have no experience. I have never known what it is to feel sinful. In the same way, I completely lack any reliable criterion for ascertaining what constitutes a prick of conscience. From all accounts, a prick of conscience does not seem to be a very estimable thing. Once it was done, I should hate to leave an action of mine in the lurch. I should prefer completely to omit the evil outcome, the consequences, from the problem concerning the value of an action. In the face of evil consequences, one is too ready to lose the proper standpoint from which one's deeds ought to be considered. A brick of conscience strikes me as a sort of evil eye. Something that has failed should be honoured all the more jealously, precisely because it has failed. This is much more in keeping with my morality. God, the immorality of the soul, 
salvation, a beyond. To all these notions, even as a child, I never paid any attention whatsoever. Nor did I waste any time upon them. Maybe I was never naive enough for that. I am quite unacquainted with atheism as a result, and still less as an event in my life. In me it is inborn, instinctive. I am too inquisitive, too incredulous, too high-spirited to be satisfied with such a palpably clumsy solution of things. God is a too palpably clumsy solution of things. A solution which shows a lack of delicacy towards us thinkers. At bottom, he is really no more than a coarse and rude prohibition of us. Ye shall not think. I am much more interested in another question, a question upon which the salvation of humanity depends to a far greater degree than it does upon any piece of theological curiosity. I refer to nutrition. For ordinary purposes, it may be formulated as follows. How precisely must thou feed thyself in order to attain to thy maximum power or virtue in the Renaissance style, a virtue free from moralic acid? My experiences in regard to this matter have been as bad as they possibly could be. I am surprised that I said myself this question so late in life, and that it took me so long to draw rational conclusions from my experiences. Only the absolute worthlessness of German culture, its idealism, can to some extent explain how it was that precisely in this matter I was so backward that my ignorance was almost saintly. This culture, which from first to last teaches one to lose sight of actual things and to hunt after thoroughly problematic and so-called ideal aims, as, for instance, classical culture, as if it were not hopeless from the start to try to unite classical and German in one concept. It is even a little comical. Try and imagine a classically cultured citizen of Leipzig. <laughs> Indeed, I can say up to a very mature age, my food was entirely bad. Expressed morally, it was impersonal, selfless, altruistic, to the glory of cooks and all other fellow Christians. It was though the cooking in vogue at Leipzig, for instance, together with my first study of Schopenhauer, 1865, that I earnestly renounced my will to live. To spoil one's stomach by absorbing insufficient nourishment, this problem seemed to my mind solved with admirable felicity by the above-mentioned cookery. It is said that in the year 1866, changes were introduced into this department. But as to German cookery in general, what has it not got on its conscience? Soup before the meal? Still called alla tedesca, in the Venetian cookery books of the 16th century. Meat boiled to shreds. Vegetables cooked with fat and flour, the degeneration of pastries into paperweights. And, if you add thereto the absolutely bestial post-prandial drinking habits of the ancients, and not alone of the ancient Germans, you will understand where German intellect took its origin. That is to say, in sadly disordered intestines. German intellect is indigestion. It can assimilate nothing. But even English diet, which in comparison with German, and indeed with French alimentation, seems to me to constitute a return to nature, that is to say, to cannibalism. 
is profoundly opposed to my own instincts. It seems to me to give the intellect heavy feet, in fact, Englishwoman's feet. The best cooking is that of Piedmont. Alcoholic drinks do not agree with me. A single glass of wine or beer a day is amply sufficient to turn life into a valley of tears for me. In Munich live my antipods. Although I admit that this knowledge came to me somewhat late, it already formed part of my experience even as a child. As a boy I believed that the drinking of wine and the smoking of tobacco were at first but the vanities of youth, and later merely bad habits. Maybe the poor wine of Naumburg was partly responsible for this poor opinion of wine in general. In order to believe that wine was exhilarating, I should have to have been a Christian. In other words, I should have had to believe in what, to my mind, is an absurdity. Strange to say, whereas small quantities of alcohol, taken with plenty of water, succeeded in making me feel out of sorts, large quantities turned me almost into a rollicking tar. Even as a boy, I showed my bravado in this respect. To compose a long Latin essay in one night, to revise and recopy it, to aspire with my pen to emulating the exactitude and the terseness of my model, Sallust, and to pour a few very strong grogs over it all. This mode of procedure, while I was a pupil at the venerable old school of Forta, was not in the least out of keeping with my physiology, nor perhaps with that of Sallust, however much it may have seemed alien to dignified Perforta. Later on, towards the middle of my life, I grew more and more opposed to alcoholic drinks. I, an opponent of vegetarianism, who have experienced what vegetarianism is, just as Wagner, who converted me back to meat, experienced it, cannot with sufficient earnestness advise all more spiritual natures to abstain absolutely from alcohol. Water answers the purpose. I have a predilection in favour of those places where in all directions one has opportunities of drinking from running brooks. Nice, Turin, Sils. In vino veritas. It seems that here, once more, I am at variance with the rest of the world about the concept, truth. With me spirit moves on the face of the waters. Here are a few more indications as to my morality. A heavy meal is digested more easily than an inadequate one. The first principle of a good digestion is that the stomach should become active as a whole. A man ought, therefore, to know the size of his stomach. For the same reasons, all those interminable meals, which I call interrupted sacrificial feasts, and which are to be had at any table de haute, are strongly to be depreciated. Nothing should be eaten between meals. Coffee should be given up. Coffee makes one gloomy. Tea is beneficial only in the morning. It should be taken in small quantities, but very strong. It may be very harmful and indispose you for the whole day if it is taken for the least bit too weak. Everybody has his own standard in this matter, often between the narrowest and most delicate limits. In an enerviating climate, tea is not a good beverage with which to start the day. An hour before taking it, an excellent thing is to drink a cup of thick cocoa freed from oil. Remain seated as little as possible. Put no trust in any thought that is not born in the open, to the accompaniment of free bodily motion, nor in one in which even the muscles do not celebrate a feast. All prejudices take their origin in the intestines. 
a sedentary life, as I have already said elsewhere, is the real sin against the Holy Spirit. 2. To the question of nutrition, that of locality and climate is next of kin. Nobody is so constituted as to be able to live everywhere and anywhere. And he who has greatest duties to perform, which lay claim to all his strength, has, in this respect, a very limited choice. The influence of climate upon the bodily functions, affecting their acceleration or retardation, extends so far that a blunder in the choice of locality and climate is able not only to alienate a man from his actual duty, but also to withhold it from him altogether, so that he never even comes face to face with it. Animal vigour never acquires enough strength in him in order to reach that pitch of artistic freedom which makes his own soul whisper to him, I alone can do that. Ever so slight a tendency to laziness in the intestines once it has become a habit, is quite sufficient to make something mediocre, something German, out of a genius. The climate of Germany, alone, is enough to discourage the strongest and most heroically disposed intestines. The tempo of the body's functions is closely bound up with the agility or the clumsiness of the spirit's feet. Spirit itself is indeed only a form of these organic functions. Let anybody make a list of the places in which men of great intellect have been found, and are still found, where wit, subtlety, and malice constitute happiness, where genius is almost necessarily at home. All of them rejoice in exceptionally dry air. Paris, Provence, Florence, Jerusalem, Athens. These names prove something, namely, that genius is conditioned by dry air, by a pure sky, that is to say, by rapid organic functions, by the constant and ever-present possibility of procuring for oneself great and even enormous quantities of strength. I have a certain case in mind in which a man of remarkable intellect and independent spirit became a narrow, craven specialist, and a grumpy old crank, simply owing to a lack of subtlety in his instincts for climate. And I myself might have been an example of the same thing, if illness had not compelled me to reason, and to reflect upon reason realistically. Now that I have learned through long practice to read the effects of climate and meteorological influences from my own body, as though from a very delicate and reliable instrument, and that I am able to calculate the change in degrees of atmospheric moisture by means of physiological observations upon myself, even on so short a journey as that from Turin to Milan. I think with horror of the ghastly fact that my whole life, until the last ten years, the most perilous years, has always been spent in the wrong, and what to me ought to have been the most forbidden places, Naumburg, Forta, Thuringia in general, Leipzig, Bala, Venice, so many ill-starred places for a constitution like mine. If I cannot recall one single happy reminiscence of my childhood and youth, it is nonsense to suppose that so-called moral causes could account for this, as, for instance, the incontestable fact that I lacked companions that could have satisfied me. For this fact is the same today as ever it was and it does not prevent me from being cheerful and brave. But it was ignorance in physiological matters, that confounded idealism, 
That was the real curse on my life. This was the superfluous and foolish element in my existence, something from which nothing could spring, and for which there can be no settlement and no compensation. As the outcome of this idealism, I regard all the blunders, the great aberrations of instinct, the modern specialization which drew me aside from the task of my life, as, for instance, the fact that I became a philologist. Why not at least a medical man, or anything else which might have opened my eyes? My days at Bala, the whole of my intellectual routine, including my daily timetable, was an absolutely senseless abuse of extraordinary powers, without the slightest compensation for the strength that I spent without even a thought of what I was squandering and how its place might be filled. I lacked all subtlety in egotism, all the fostering care of an imperative instinct. I was in a state in which one is ready to regard oneself as anybody's equal, a state of disinterestedness, a forgetting of one's distance from others, something, in short, for which I can never forgive myself. When I had well nigh reached the end of my tether, simply because I had almost reached my end, I began to reflect upon the fundamental absurdity of my life, idealism. It was illness that first brought me to reason. 3. After the choice of nutrition, the choice of climate and locality, the third matter concerning which one must not on any account make a blunder, is the choice of the manner in which one recuperates one's strength. Here again, according to the extent to which a spirit is sui generis, the limits of which he can allow himself, in other words, the limits of that which is beneficial to him become more and more confined. As far as I in particular am concerned, reading, in general, belongs to my means of recuperation. Consequently, it belongs to that which rids me of myself, to that which enables me to wander in strange sciences and strange souls, to that, in fact, about which I am no longer in earnest. Indeed, it is while reading that I recover from my earnestness. During the time that I am deeply absorbed in my work, no books are found within my reach. It would never occur to me to allow anyone to speak or even think in my presence, for that is what reading would mean. Has anyone ever actually noticed that during the period of profound tension, to which the state of pregnancy condemns not only the mind, but also, at bottom, the whole organism, accident, and every kind of external stimulus acts too acutely and strikes too deep? Accident and external stimuli must, as far as possible, be avoided. A sort of walling of one's self in is one of the primary instinctive precautions of spiritual pregnancy. Shall I allow a strange thought to steal secretly over the wall? For that is what reading would mean. The periods of work and fruitfulness are followed by periods of recuperation. Come hither, ye delightful, intellectual, intelligent books. Shall I read German books? I must go back six months to catch myself with a book in my hand. What was it? An excellent study by Victor Brochard upon the Greek sceptics, in which my La Tertiana was used to advantage. Translator's footnote. Nietzsche, as is well known, devoted much time when a student at Leipzig to the study of three Greek philosophers, Theogenes, Diogenes Laertius, and Democritus. This study first bore fruit in the case of a paper, Zur Geschichte der 
Theodignation Spruchsamlog, which was subsequently published by the most influential journal of classical philology in Germany. Later, however, it enabled Nietzsche to enter for the prize offered by the University of Leipzig for an essay, De Fontibus Dionigis Lierti. He was successful in gaining the prize, and the treatise was afterwards published in the Rheinisches Museum, and is still quoted as an authority. It is to this essay, written when he was twenty-three years of age, that he here refers. And translator's note. The skeptics, the only honourable types among that double-faced and sometimes quintuple-faced throng, the philosophers. Otherwise, I almost always take refuge in the same books. Altogether, their number is small. They are books which are precisely my proper fare. It is not, perhaps, in my nature to read much, and of all sorts, a library makes me ill. Neither is it my nature to love much or many kinds of things. Suspicion, or even hostility, towards new books is much more akin to my instinctive feeling than toleration. La gère de cure and other forms of neighbour love. It is to a small number of old French authors that I always return again and again. I believe only in French culture, and regard everything else in Europe which calls itself culture as a misunderstanding. I do not even take the German kind into consideration. The few instances of higher culture with which I have met in Germany were all French in their origin, the most striking example of this was Madame Cosima Wagner, by far the most decisive voice in matters of taste that I have ever heard. If I do not read, but literally love Pascal, as the most instinctive sacrifice to Christianity, killing himself inch by inch, first bodily, then spiritually, according to the terrible consistency of this most appalling form of inhuman cruelty, if I have something of Montaigne's mischievousness in my soul, and, who knows, perhaps also in my body, if my artist's tastes endeavour to defend the name of Moliere, Cornelli, and Rancine, and not without bitterness against such a wild genius as Shakespeare, all this does not prevent me from regarding even the latter-day Frenchmen also as charming companions. I can think of absolutely no century in history in which a net full of more inquisitive and at the same time more subtle psychologists could be drawn up together than in Paris of the present day. Let me mention a few at random, for their number is by no means small. Paul Bourges, Pierre Loti, Gip, Mailhac, Anatole France, Jules Lamache, or, to point to one of strong race, a genuine Latin, of whom I am particularly fond, Guy de Maupassant. Between ourselves, I prefer this generation even to its masters, all of whom were corrupted by German philosophy, Taine, for instance, by Hegel, who he has to thank for his misunderstanding of great men and great periods. Wherever Germany extends her sway, she ruins culture. It was the war which first saved the spirit of France. Stendhal is one of the happiest accidents of my life, for everything that marks an epoch in it has been brought to me by accident and never by means of a recommendation. He is quite priceless, with his psychologist's eye quick at forestalling and anticipating. With his grasp of facts, which is reminiscent of the same art in the greatest of all masters of fact, Exangui Napoleon, and, last but not least, as an honest atheist, a specimen which is both rare and difficult to discover in France, all honour to Prosper Merimi. 
Maybe I am even envious of Stendhal. He robbed me of the best atheistic joke, which I, of all people, could have perpetrated. God's only excuse is that he does not exist. I myself have said somewhere, what has been the greatest objection to life hitherto? God. 4. It was Heinrich Heine who gave me the most perfect idea of what a lyrical poet could be. In vain do I search through all the kingdoms of antiquity or of modern times for anything to resemble his sweet and passionate music. He possessed that divine wickedness, without which perfection itself becomes unthinkable to me. I estimate the value of men, of races, according to the extent to which they are unable to conceive of a god who has not a dash of the satyr in him, and with what mastery he wields his native tongue. One day it will be said of Heine and me that we were by far the greatest artists of the German language that have ever existed, and that we left all the efforts that mere Germans made in this language an incalculable distance behind us. I must be profoundly related to Byron's Manfred. Of all the dark abysses in this work, I found the counterparts in my own soul. At the age of thirteen, I was ripe for this book. Words fail me. I have only a look for those who dare to utter the name of Faust in the presence of Manfred. The Germans are incapable of conceiving anything sublime. For the proof of this, Look at Schumann. Out of anger for this mawkish Saxon, I once deliberately composed a counter-overture to Manfred, of which Hans von Bülow declared he had never seen the like before on paper. Such compositions amounted to a violation of Euterp. When I cast about me for my highest formula of Shakespeare, I can invariably find but this one that he conceived the type of Caesar. Such things a man cannot guess. Either he is a thing, or he is not. The great poet draws his creations only from out of his own reality. This is so to such an extent, that often after a lapse of time, he can no longer endure his own work. After casting a glance between the pages of my Zarathustra, I pace my room to and fro for half an hour at a time, unable to overcome an insufferable fit of tears. I know of no more heart-rending reading than Shakespeare, how a man must have suffered to be so much in need of playing the clown. Is Hamlet understood? It is not doubt, but certitude that drives one mad. But in order to feel this, one must be profound, one must be an abyss, a philosopher. We all fear the truth. And to make a confession, I feel instinctively certain and convinced that Lord Bacon is the originator, the self-torturer of this most sinister kind of literature. What do I care about the miserable gabble of American muddlers and blockheads? But the power for the greatest realism in vision, is not only compatible with the greatest realism in deeds, with the monstrous in deeds, with crime. It actually presupposes the latter. We do not know half enough about Lord Bacon. The first realist, in all the highest acceptation of this word, to be sure of everything he did, everything he willed, and everything he experienced in his inmost soul. Let the critics go to hell. Suppose I had christened my Zarathustra with a name not my own, let us say with Richard Wagner's name. The acumen of two thousand years would not have sufficed to guess that the author of Human All Too Human was the visionary of Zarathustra. 
5. As I am here speaking of the recreations of my life, I feel I must express a word or two of gratitude for that which has refreshed me by far the most heartily and most profoundly. This, without the slightest doubt, was my intimate relationship with Richard Wagner. All my other relationships with men I treat quite lightly, but I would not have the days I spent at Tribuchen, those days of confidence, of cheerfulness, of sublime flashes, and of profound moments, blotted from my life at any price. I know not what Wagner may have been for others, but no cloud ever darkened our sky. And this brings me back again to France. I have no arguments against Wagnerites and hoc genus omni, who believe that they do honour to Wagner by believing him to be like themselves. For such people I have only a contemptuous curl of my lip. With a nature like mine, which is so strange to everything Teutonic, that even the presence of a German retards my digestion. My first meeting with Wagner was the first moment in my life in which I breathed freely. I felt him, I honoured him as a foreigner, as the opposite and the incarnate contradiction of all German virtues. We, who as children breathed the marshy atmosphere of the fifties, are necessarily pessimists in regard to the concept German. We cannot be anything else than revolutionaries. We can assent to no state of affairs which allows the canting bigot to be at the top. I care not a jot whether this canting bigot acts in different colours today, whether he dresses in scarlet or dons a uniform of a hussar. Translator's footnote. The favourite uniform of the German Emperor, William II. End translator's note. Very well, then. Wagner was a revolutionary. He fled from the Germans. As an artist, a man has no home in Europe save in Paris. That subtlety of all the five senses which Wagner's art presupposes, those fingers that can detect slight gradations, psychological morbidities, all these things can only be found in Paris. Nowhere else can you meet with this passion for questions of form, this earnestness in matters of mise-en-scene, which is the Parisian earnestness par excellence. In Germany, no one has any idea of the tremendous ambition that fills the heart of a Parisian artist. The German is a good fellow. Wagner was by no means a good fellow. But I have already said quite enough on the subject of Wagner's real nature. See Beyond Good and Evil, Aphorism 269. And about those to whom he is most closely related. He is one of the late French romanticists, that high-soaring and heaven-aspiring band of artists, like Delacroix and Berlioz, who in their inmost natures are sick and incurable, and who are all fanatics of expression, and virtuosos through and through. Who, in sooth, was the first intelligent follower of Wagner? Charles Baudelaire, the very man who first understood Delacroix, that typical decadent, in whom a whole generation of artists saw their reflection. He was perhaps the last of them too. What is it? that I have never forgiven Wagner? The fact that he condescended to the Germans, that he became a German imperialist. Wherever Germany spreads, she ruins culture. 6. Taking everything into consideration, I could never have survived my youth without Wagnerian music for I was condemned to the society of Germans. If a man wished to get rid of a feeling of insufferable oppression, he has to take to hashish. Well, I had to take to Wagner. 
Wagner is the counterpoison to everything essentially German. The fact that he is a poison too, I do not deny. From the moment that Tristan was arranged for the piano, all honour to you, Herr von Bullo, I was a Wagnerite. Wagner's previous works seemed beneath me. They were too commonplace, too German. But to this day, I am still seeking for a work which would be a match to Tristan in dangerous fascination and possess the same gruesome and dulcet quality of infinity. I seek among all the arts in vain. All the quaint features of Leonardo da Vinci's work lose their charm at the sound of the first bar in Tristan. This work is without question Wagner's Nun Plus Ultra. After its creation, the composition of the Master Singers and of the Ring was a relaxation to him. To become more healthy, this in a nature like Wagner's amounts to going backwards. The curiosity of the psychologist is so great in me that I regard it as quite a special privilege to have lived at the right time and to have lived precisely among Germans in order to be ripe for this work. The world must indeed be empty for him who has never been unhealthy enough for this infernal voluptuousness. It is allowable, it is even imperative, to employ a mystic formula for this purpose. I suppose I know better than anyone the prodigious feats of which Wagner was capable, the fifty worlds of strange ecstasies to which no one else had wings to soar. And as I am alive today, and strong enough to turn even the most suspicious and most dangerous things to my own advantage, and thus to grow stronger, I declare Wagner to have been the greatest benefactor of my life. The bond which unites us is the fact that we have suffered greater agony, even at each other's hands, than most men are able to bear nowadays, and this will always keep our names associated in the minds of men. For, just as Wagner is merely a misunderstanding among Germans, so, in truth, am I, and ever will be. Ye lack two centuries of psychological and artistic discipline, my dear countrymen, but you can never recover the time lost. 7. To the most exceptional of my readers, I should like to say just one word about what I really exact from music. It must be cheerful and yet profound, like an October afternoon. It must be original, exuberant and tender and like a dainty soft woman in roguishness and grace. I shall never admit that a German can understand what music is. Those musicians who are called German, the greatest and most famous foremost, are all foreigners, either Slavs, Croats, Italians, Dutchmen, or Jews, or else like Heinrich Schultz, Bach, and Handel, they are Germans of a strong race which is now extinct. For my own part, I have still enough of the pole left in me to let all other music go, if only I can keep Chopin. For three reasons I would accept Wagner's Siegfried Idyll, and perhaps also one or two things of Liszt who excelled all other musicians in the noble tone of his orchestration, and finally everything that has been produced beyond the Alps, this side of the Alps. Translator's note. In the later years of his life, Nietzsche practically made Italy his home. End translator's note. 
I could not possibly dispense with Rossini, and still less with my southern soul in music, the work of my Venetian maestro, Pietro Gasti. <laughs> and when I say beyond the Alps, all I really mean is Venice. If I try to find a new word for music, I can never find any other than Venice. I know not how to draw any distinction between tears and music. I do not know how to think either of joy or of the South without a shudder of fear. On the bridge I stood lately, in gloomy night, came a distant song. In golden drops it rolled over the glittering rim away. Music, gondolas, lights, drunk, swam far forth in the gloom. A stringed instrument, my soul, sang, imperceptibly moved, a gondola song by stealth, gleaming for gaudy blessedness. Hearkened any thereto? Eight. In all these things, in the choice of food, place, climate, and recreation, the instinct of self-preservation is dominant, and this instinct manifests itself with the least ambiguity when it acts as an instinct of defense. To close one's eyes to much, to seal one's ears to much, to keep certain things at a distance, this is the first principle of prudence the first proof of the fact that a man is not an accident but a necessity the popular word for this instinct of defence is taste a man's imperative command is not only to say no in cases where yes would be a sign of disinterestedness but also to say no as seldom as possible one must part with all that which compels one to repeat no with ever greater frequency. The rationale of this principle is that all discharges of defensive forces, however slight they may be, involve enormous and absolutely superfluous losses when they become regular and habitual. Our greatest expenditure of strength is made up of those small and most frequent discharges of it. The act of keeping things off, of holding them at a distance, amounts to a discharge of strength. Do not deceive yourselves on this point. And an expenditure of energy directed at purely negative ends. Simply by being compelled to keep constantly on his guard, a man may grow so weak as to be unable any longer to defend himself. Suppose I were to step out of my house and instead of the quiet and aristocratic city of Turin, I was to find a German provincial town. My instinct would have to brace itself together in order to repel all that which would pour in upon it from this crushed down and cowardly world. Or suppose I was to find a large German city, that structure of vice in which nothing grows, but where every single thing, whether good or bad, is squeezed in from outside. In such circumstances, should I not be compelled to become a hedgehog? But to have prickles amounts to a squandering of strength. They even constitute a twofold luxury, when, if only we choose to do so, we could dispense with them and open our hands instead. Another form of prudence and self-defense consists in trying to react as seldom as possible and to keep oneself aloof from those circumstances and conditions wherein one would be condemned, as it were, to suspend one's liberty and one's initiative and become a mere reacting medium. As an example of this, I point to the intercourse with books. The scholar who, in sooth, does little else than handle books, 
with the philologist of average attainments, their number may amount to two hundred a day. Ultimately forgets entirely and completely the capacity of thinking for himself. When he has not a book between his fingers, he cannot think. When he thinks, he responds to a stimulus, a thought he has read. Finally, all he does is to react. The scholar exhausts his whole strength in saying either yes or no to matter which has already been thought out, or in criticizing it. He is no longer capable of thought on his own account. In him, the instinct of self-defense has decayed, otherwise he would defend himself against books. The scholar is a decadent. With my own eyes I have seen gifted, richly endowed, and free-spirited natures already read to ruins at thirty, and mere wax vestas that have to be rubbed before they can give off any sparks, or thoughts. To set too early in the morning, at the break of day, in all the fullness and dawn of one's strength, and to read a book, this I call positively vicious. 9. At this point I can no longer evade a direct answer to the question, how one becomes what one is, and in giving it, I shall have to touch upon that masterpiece in art of self-preservation, which is selfishness. Granted that one's life task, the determination and the fate of one's life task, greatly exceeds the average measure of such things, nothing more dangerous could be conceived than to come face to face with one's self by the side of this life task. The fact that one becomes what one is presupposes that one has not the remotest suspicion of what one is. From this standpoint, even the blunders of one's life have their own meaning and value. The temporary deviations and aberrations, the moments of hesitation and of modesty, the earnestness wasted upon duties which lie outside the actual life task, in these matters great wisdom, perhaps even the highest wisdom, comes into activity. In these circumstances, in which noske tipsum would be the sure road to ruin, forgetting oneself, misunderstanding oneself, belittling oneself, narrowing oneself, and making oneself mediocre amount to reason itself. Expressed morally, to love one's neighbor, and to live for others, and for other things may be the means of protection employed to maintain the hardest kind of egotism. This is the exceptional case in which I, contrary to my principle and conviction, take the side of the altruistic instincts. For here they are concerned in subserving selfishness and self-discipline. The whole surface of consciousness for consciousness is a surface, must be kept free from any one of the great imperatives. Beware even of every striking word, of every striking attitude. They are all so many risks, which the instinct runs of understanding itself too soon. Meanwhile, the organizing idea, which is destined to become master, grows and continues to grow into the depths. It begins to command. It leads you slowly back from your deviations and aberrations. It prepares individual qualities and capacities, which one day will make themselves felt as indispensable to the whole of your task. Step by step, it cultivates all the serviceable faculties before it even whispers a word concerning the dominant task, the goal, the object, and the meaning of it all. Looked at from this standpoint, my life is simply amazing. 
for the task of transvaluing values. More capacities were needful, perhaps, than could well be found side by side in one individual. Above all, antagonistic capacities, which had to be free from the mutual strife and destruction which they involve. An order of rank among capacities. Distance. The art of separating without creating hostility. To refrain from confounding things. To keep from reconciling things. To possess enormous multifariousness and yet to be the reverse of chaos. All this was the first condition, the long secret work and the artistic mastery of my instinct. Its superior guardianship manifested itself with such exceeding strength that not once did I ever dream of what was growing within me, until suddenly all my capacities were ripe, and one day burst forth in all the perfection of their highest bloom. I cannot remember ever having exerted myself. I can point to no trace of struggle in my life. I am the reverse of a heroic nature. To will something, to strive after something, to have an aim or a desire in my mind, I know none of these things from experience. Even at this moment, I look out upon my future, a broad future, as upon a calm sea. No sigh of longing makes a ripple on its surface. I have not the slightest wish that anything should be otherwise than it is. I myself would not be otherwise. But in this matter, I have always been the same. I have never had a desire. A man who, after his four-and-fortieth year, can say that he has never bothered himself about honours, women, or money. Not that they did not come his way. It was thus that I became one day a university professor. I never had the remotest idea of such a thing, for I was scarcely four-and-twenty years of age. In the same way, two years previously, I had one day become a philologist, in the sense that my first philological work, my start in every way, was expressly obtained by my master Ritschau for publication in his Rheinisches Museum. Translator's Note See note on page 37 and translator's note. Narrator's Note This refers to the footnote in Aphorism 3 and narrator's note. Ritschau and I say it in all reverence, was the only genial scholar that I have ever met. He possessed that pleasant kind of depravity which distinguishes us Thuringians, and which makes even a German sympathetic. Even in the pursuit of truth, we prefer to avail ourselves of roundabout ways. In saying this, I do not mean to underestimate in any way my Thuringian brother the intelligent Leopold von Rank. 10. You may be wondering why I should actually have related all these trivial and, according to traditional accounts, insignificant details to you. Such action can but tell against me, more particularly if I am fated to figure in great causes. To this I reply that these trivial matters, diet, locality, climate, and one's mode of recreation, the whole casuistry of self-love, are inconceivably more important than all that which has hitherto been held in high esteem. It is precisely in this quarter that we must begin to learn afresh all those things which mankind has valued with such earnestness heretofore are not even real. They are mere creations of fancy, or more strictly speaking, lies, born of the evil instincts of diseased and, in the deepest sense, noxious natures, 
all the concepts God, soul, virtue, sin, beyond, truth, eternal life, but the greatness of human nature, its divinity, were sought for in them. All questions of politics, of social order, of education, have been falsified, root and branch, owing to the fact that the most noxious men have been taken for great men, and that people were taught to despise the small things, or rather, the fundamental things of life. If I now choose to compare myself with those creatures who have hitherto been honoured as the first among men, the difference becomes obvious. I do not reckon the so-called first men even as human beings. For me, they are the excrements of mankind, the products of disease and of the instincts of revenge. They are so many monsters laden with rottenness, so many hopeless incurables who avenge themselves on life. I wish to be the opposite of these people. It is my privilege to have the very sharpest discernment for every sign of healthy instincts. There is no such thing as a morbid trait in me. Even in times of serious illness, I have never grown morbid. You might seek in vain for a trace of fanaticism in my nature. No one can point to any moment of my life in which I have assumed either an arrogant or a pathetic attitude. Pathetic attitudes are not in keeping with greatness. He who needs attitudes is false. Beware of all picturesque men. Life was easy, in fact easiest, to me, in those periods when it exacted the heaviest duties from me. Whoever could have seen me during the seventy days of this autumn, when, without interruption, I did a host of things of the highest rank, things that no man can do nowadays, with a sense of responsibility for all the ages yet to come, would have noticed no sign of tension in my condition, but rather a state of overflowing freshness and good cheer. Never have I eaten with more pleasant sensations. Never has my sleep been better. I know of no other manner of dealing with great tasks than as play. This is a sign of greatness, is an essential prequisite. The slightest constraint, the sombre mane, any hard accent in the voice, all these things are objections to a man, but how much more to his work? One must not have nerves. Even to suffer from solitude is an objection. The only thing I have always suffered from is the multitude. Translator's note. The German words are Einsamkeit and Fielsamkeit. The latter was coined by Nietzsche. The English words multitude should, therefore, be understood as signifying multifarious instincts and gifts, which in Nietzsche strove for ascendancy and caused him more suffering than any solitude. Complexity of this sort, held in check by a dominant instinct, as in Nietzsche's case, is of course the only possible basis for an artistic nature. End translator's note. At an absurdly tender age, in fact, when I was seven years old, I already knew that no human speech would ever reach me. Did anyone ever see me sad on that account? At present, I still possess the same affability towards everybody. I am even full of consideration for the lowest. In all this, there is not an atom of haughtiness or of secret contempt. He whom I despise soon guesses that he is despised by me. The very fact of my existence is enough to rouse indignation in all those who have polluted blood in their veins. My formula 
for greatness in man is amor fati the fact that a man wishes nothing to be different either in front of him or behind him or for all eternity not only must the necessary be born and on no account concealed all idealism is falsehood in the face of necessity but it must also be loved End of Why I Am So Clever Chapter 3, Part 1 of Ecce Homo by Friedrich Nietzsche Translated by Anthony M. Ludovici Why I Write Such Excellent Books, Part 1 1. I am one thing, my creations are another. Here, before I speak of the books themselves, I shall touch upon the question of the understanding and misunderstanding with which they have met. I shall proceed to do this in as perfunctory a manner as the occasion demands, for the time has by no means come for this question. My time has not yet come either. Some men are born posthumously. One day institutions will be needed in which men will live and teach, as I understand living and teaching, may be also, that by that time chairs will be founded and endowed for the interpretation of Zarathustra. But I should regard it as a complete contradiction of myself if I expected to find ears and eyes for my truths today. The fact that no one listens to me, that no one knows how to receive at my hands today, is not only comprehensible, it seems to me quite the proper thing. I do not wish to be mistaken for another, and to this end I must not mistake myself. To repeat what I have already said, I can point to but few instances of ill-will in my life, and as for literary ill-will, I could scarcely mention a single example of it. On the other hand, I have met with far too much pure foolery. It seems to me that to take up one of my books is one of the rarest honours that a man can pay himself even supposing that he put his shoes off from his feet beforehand, not to mention boots. When on one occasion Dr. Heinrich von Stein honestly complained that he could not understand a word of my Zarathustra, I said to him that this was just as it should be, to have understood six sentences in that book, that is to say, to have lived them raises a man to a higher level among mortals than modern man can attain. With this feeling of distance, how could I even wish to be read by the moderns whom I know? My triumph is just the opposite of what Schopenhauer's was. I say, non legur, non legar. Not that I should like to underestimate the pleasure I have derived from the innocence with which my works have been frequently contradicted. As late as last summer, at a time when I was attempting, perhaps by means of my weighty, all too weighty literature, to throw the rest of literature off its balance, a certain professor of Berlin University kindly gave me to understand that I ought really to make use of a different form. No one could read such stuff as I wrote. Finally, it was not Germany, but Switzerland that presented me with the two most extreme cases. An essay on Beyond Good and Evil by Dr. V. Wittmann in the paper called the Bund, under the heading Nietzsche's Dangerous Book, 
and a general account of all my works from the pen of Herr Karl Spitteler, also in the Bund, constitute a maximum in my life. I shall not say of what. The latter treated my Zarathustra, for instance, as advanced exercises in style, and expressed the wish that later on I might try and attend to the question of substance as well. Dr. Wildman assured me of this respect for the courage I showed in endeavouring to abolish all decent feeling. Thanks to a little trick of destiny, every sentence in these criticisms seemed, with a consistency that I could but admire, to be an inverted truth. In fact, it was most remarkable that all one had to do was to transvalue all values, in order to hit the nail on the head with regard to me, instead of striking my head with the nail. I am more particularly anxious, therefore, to discover an explanation. After all, no one can draw more out of things, books included, than he already knows. A man has no ears for that to which experience has given him no access. To take an extreme case, suppose a book contains simply incidents which lie quite outside the range of general or even rare experience. Suppose it to be the first language to express a whole series of experiences. In this case, nothing it contains will really be heard at all, and, thanks to an acoustic delusion, people will believe that where nothing is heard, there is nothing to hear. This, at least, has been my usual experience, and proves, if you will, the originality of my experience. He who thought he had understood something in my work had, as a rule, adjusted something in it to his own image, not infrequently the very opposite of myself, an idealist, for instance. He who understood nothing in my work would deny that I was worth considering at all. The word superman, which designates a type of man that would be one of nature's rarest and luckiest strokes, as opposed to modern men, to good men, to Christians and other nihilists, a word which in the mouth of Zarathustra, the annihilator of morality, acquires a very profound meaning, is understood almost everywhere, and with perfect innocence, in light of those values to which a flat contradiction was made manifest in the figure of Zarathustra, that is to say, as an ideal type, a higher kind of man, half saint and half genius. Other learned cattle have suspected me of Darwinism on account of this word, even the hero cult of that great unconscious and involuntary swindler, Carlyle, a cult which I repudiate with such roguish malice, was recognized in my doctrine. Once, when I whispered to a man that he would do better to seek for the superman in a Caesar Borgia, than in a Parsifal, he could not believe his ears. The fact that I have been quite free from curiosity in regard to criticism of my books, more particularly when they appear in newspapers, will have to be forgiven me. My friends and my publishers know this, and never speak to me of such things. In one particular case, I once saw all the sins that had been committed against a single book. It was beyond good and evil. I could tell you a nice story about it. Is it possible that in the National Zeitung, a Prussian paper, this comment is for the sake of my foreign readers, for my own part I beg to state 
I read only Le Journal des Débats. Really and seriously regarded the book as a sign of the times, or a genuine and typical example of Tory philosophy, for which the Kreutz Zeitung had not sufficient courage. Translator's footnote, Junke philosophy. The landed proprietors constitute a dominating class in Prussia, and it is from this class that all officers and higher officials are drawn. The Krauszeitung is an organ of the Junke party. End translator's note. Two. This was said for the benefit of Germans, for everywhere else I have my readers, all of them exceptionally intelligent men, characters that have won their spurs and that have been reared in high offices and superior duties. I have even real geniuses among my readers, in Vienna, in St. Petersburg, in Stockholm, in Copenhagen, in Paris and New York, I have been discovered everywhere. I have not yet been discovered in Europe's flatland, Germany. And, to make a confession, I rejoice much more heartily over those who do not read me, over those who have neither heard of my name nor of the word philosophy. But whithersoever I go, here in Turin, for instance, every face brightens and softens at the sight of me, a thing that has flattered me more than anything else hitherto is the fact that old market women cannot rest until they have picked out the sweetest of their grapes for me to this extent must a man be a philosopher it is not in vain that the poles are considered as the french among the slavs a charming russian lady will not be mistaken for a single moment concerning my origin. I am not successful at being pompous. The most I can do is to appear embarrassed. I can think in German. I can feel in German. I can do most things, but this is beyond my powers. My old master Ritzschel went so far as to declare that I planned even my philosophical treatise after the manner of a Parisian novelist, <laughs> that I made them absurdly thrilling. In Paris itself, people are surprised at toutes mes audaces et finesse. The words of Monsieur Taines. I fear that even in the highest forms of the diathram, that salt will be found pervading my work which never becomes insipid, which never becomes German, and that is wit. I can do naught else. God help me. Amen. We all know, some of us even from experience, what a long ears is. Well then, I venture to assert that I have the smallest ears that have ever been seen. This fact is not without interest to women. It seems to me they feel that I understand them better. I am essentially the anti-ass, and on this account alone, a monster in the world's history. In Greek, and not only in Greek, I am the Antichrist. 3. I am to a great extent aware of my privileges as a writer. In one or two cases, it has even been brought home to me how very much the habitual reading of my works spoils a man's taste. Other books simply cannot be endured after mine, and least of all philosophical ones. It is an incomparable distinction to cross the threshold of this noble and subtle world. In order to do so, one must certainly not be a German. It is, in short, a distinction which one must have deserved. He, however, 
who is related to me through loftiness of will, experiences genuine raptures of understanding in my books. For I swoop down from heights into which no bird has ever soared, I know abysses into which no foot has ever slipped. People have told me that it is impossible to lay down a book of mine, that I disturb even the night's rest. There is no prouder, or at the same time more subtle kind of books. They sometimes attain to the highest pinnacle of earthly endeavour, cynicism. To capture their thoughts a man must have the tenderest fingers, as well as the most intrepid fists. Any kind of spiritual decrepitude utterly excludes all intercourse with them, even any kind of dyspepsia. A man must have no nerves, but he must have a cheerful belly. Not only the poverty of a man's soul and its stuffy air excludes all intercourse with them, but also, and to a much greater degree, cowardice, uncleanliness, and secret intestinal revengefulness. A word from my lips suffices to make the colour of all evil instincts rush into a face. Among my acquaintances, I have had a number of experimental subjects, in whom I see depicted all the different, and instructively different, reactions which follow upon a perusal of my works. Those who will have nothing to do with the contents of my books, as for instance my so-called friends, assume an impersonal tone concerning them. They wish me luck, and congratulate me for having produced another work. They also declare that my writings show progress, because they exhale a more cheerful spirit. The thoroughly vicious people, the beautiful souls, the false from top to toe, do not know in the least what to do with my books. Consequently, with the beautiful consistency of all beautiful souls, they regard my works as beneath them. The cattle among my acquaintances, the mere Germans, leave me to understand, if you please, that they are not always of my opinion, though here and there they agree with me. I have heard this even said about Zarathustra. Feminism, whether in mankind or in man, is likewise a barrier to my writings. With it, no one could ever enter into this labyrinth of fearless knowledge. To this end, a man must never have spared himself. He must have been hard in his habits in order to be good-humoured and merry among a host of inexorable truths. When I try to picture the character of a perfect reader, I always imagine a monster of courage and curiosity, as well as of suppleness, cunning, and prudence. In short, a born adventurer and explorer. After all, I could not describe better than Zarathustra has done, unto whom I really address myself, unto whom alone would he reveal his riddle? Unto you, daring explorers and experimenters, and unto all who have ever embarked beneath cunning sails upon terrible seas, unto you who revel in riddles and in twilight, whose souls are lured by flutes into every treacherous abyss, for ye care not to grope your way along a thread with craven fingers, and where you are able to guess, there you hate to argue. 4. I will now pass just one or two general remarks about my art of style. To communicate a state and inattention of pathos by means of signs including the tempo of these signs, that is, the meaning of every style, and in view of the fact that the multiplicity of inner states in me is enormous. I am capable of many kinds of style. 
in short the most multifarious art of style that any man has ever had at his disposal any style is good which genuinely communicates an inner condition which does not blunder over the signs over the tempo of the signs or over moods all the laws of phrasing are the outcome of representing moods artistically good style in itself is a piece of sheer foolery mere idealism like beauty in itself for instance or goodness in itself or the thing in itself all this takes for granted of course that there exists ears that can hear and such men as are capable and worthy of a like pathos that those are not wanting unto whom one may communicate oneself meanwhile my zarathustra for instance is still in quest of such people alas he will have to seek a long while yet a man must be worthy of listening to him and until that time there will be no one who will understand the art that has been squandered in this book no one has ever existed who has had more novel more strange and purposely created art forms to fling to the winds the fact that such things were possible in the german language still awaited proof formerly i myself would have denied most emphatically that it was possible before my time people did not know what could be done with the german language what could be done with language in general the art of grand rhythm of grand style in periods for expressing the tremendous fluctuations of the sublime and superhuman passion was first discovered by me with the diathram entitled the seven seals which constitute the last discourse of the third part of zarathustra i soared miles above all that which heretofore has been called poetry five the fact that the voice which speaks in my works is that of a psychologist who has not his peer is perhaps the first conclusion at which a good reader will arrive a reader such as i deserve and one who reads me is just as the old philologists used to read their horace those propositions about which all the world is fundamentally agreed not to speak of fashionable philosophy of moralists and other empty-headed and cabbage-brained peoples are to me but ingenuous blunders for instance the belief that altruistic and egotistic are opposites while all the time the ego itself is merely a supreme swindle an ideal there are no such things as egotistical or altruistic actions both concepts are psychological nonsense of the proposition that man pursues happiness or the proposition that happiness is the reward of virtue or the proposition that pleasure and pain are opposites morality the circe of mankind has falsified everything psychological root and branch it has bemoralized everything even to the terribly nonsensical point of calling love unselfish a man must first be firmly poised he must stand securely on his two legs otherwise he cannot love at all this indeed the girls know only too well they don't care two pins about unselfish and merely objective men may i venture to suggest incidentally that i know women this knowledge is part of my dionysian patrimony who knows maybe i am the first psychologist of the eternally feminine women all like me 
but that's an old story save of course the abortions among them the emancipated ones those who lack the wherewithal to have children thank goodness i am not willing to let myself be torn to pieces the perfect woman tears you to pieces when she loves you i know these amiable maenads oh what a dangerous creeping subterranean little beast of prey she is and so agreeable withal a little woman pursuing her vengeance would force open even the iron gates of fate itself woman is incalculably more wicked than man she is also cleverer goodness in a woman is already a sign of degeneration all cases of beautiful souls in women may be traced to the faulty physiological condition but i go no further lest i should become medicinical the struggle for equal rights is even a symptom of disease every doctor knows this the more womanly a woman is the more she fights tooth and nail against rights in general the natural order of things the eternal war between the sexes assigns to her by far the foremost rank have people had ears to hear my definition of love it is the only definition worthy of a philosopher love in this means is war in its foundation it is the mortal hatred of the sexes have you heard my reply to the question how a woman can be cured saved in fact give her a child a woman needs children man is always only a means thus spake zarathustra the emancipation of women this is the instinctive hatred of psychologically botched that is to say barren women for those of their sisters who are well constituted the fight against man is always only a means a pretext a piece of strategy by trying to rise to woman per se to higher women to the ideal woman all they wish to do is to lower the general level of woman's rank and there are no more certain means to this end than university education trousers and the rights of voting cattle truth to tell the emancipated are the anarchists in the eternally feminine world these psychological mishaps the most deep-rooted instinct of whom is revenge the whole species of the most malicious idealism which by the by also manifests itself in men in heinrich ibsen for instance that typical old maid whose object is to poison the clean conscience the natural spirit of sexual love and in order to leave no doubt in your minds in regard to my opinion which on this matter is as honest as it is severe i will reveal to you one more clause out of my moral code against vice with the word vice i combat every kind of opposition to nature or if you prefer fine words idealism the clause reads preaching of chastity is a public incitement to unnatural practices all depreciation of the sexual life all the sullying of it by means of the concept impure is the essential crime against life is the essential crime against the holy spirit of life six in order to give you some idea of myself as a psychologist let me take this curious piece of psychological analysis out of the book beyond good and evil in which it appears i forbid by the by any guessing as to whom i am describing in this passage the genius of the heart as that great anchorite possessed it the divine tempter and born pied piper of consciences 
whose voice knows how to sink into the inmost depths of every soul, who neither utters a word nor casts a glance, in which some seductive motive or trick does not lie, a part of whose masterliness is that he understands the art of seeming, not what he is, but that which will place a fresh constraint upon his followers to press ever more closely upon him, to follow him ever more enthusiastically and wholeheartedly. The genius of the heart, which makes all loud and self-conceited things hold their tongues and lend their ears, which polishes all rough souls and makes them taste a new longing, to lie placid as a mirror, that the deep heavens may be reflected in them. The genius of the heart, which teaches the clumsy and too hasty hand to hesitate and grasp more tenderly, which scents the hidden and forgotten treasure, the pearl of goodness and sweet spirituality beneath thick black ice, and is a divining rod for every grain of gold long buried and imprisoned in heaps of mud and sand. The genius of the heart from contact with which every man goes away richer, not blessed and overcome, not as though favoured and crushed by the good things of others, but richer in himself, fresher to himself than before, opened up, breathed upon and sounded by a thawing wind. More uncertain, perhaps, more delicate, more fragile, more bruised, but full of hopes which as yet lack names full of a new will and striving, full of a new unwillingness and counter-striving. The Birth of Tragedy 1. In order to be fair to The Birth of Tragedy, 1872, it is necessary to forget a few things. It created a sensation, and even fascinated by means of its mistakes by means of its application to Wagnerism, as if the latter were the sign of an ascending tendency. On that account alone, this treatise was an event in Wagner's life. Thenceforward, great hopes surrounded the name of Wagner. Even to this day, people remind me, sometimes in the middle of Parseval, that it rests on my conscience if the opinion that this movement is of great value to culture, at length became prevalent. I have often seen the book quoted as the second birth of tragedy from the spirit of music. People had ears only for new formulae for Wagner's art, his object and his mission. And in this way, the real hidden value of the book was overlooked. Hellenism and Pessimism, this would have been a less equivocal title. Seeing that the book contained the first attempt at showing how the Greeks succeeded in disposing of Pessimism, in what manner they overcame it. Tragedy itself is the proof of the fact that the Greeks were not pessimists. Schopenhauer blundered here as he blundered in everything else. Regarded impartially, The Birth of Tragedy is a book quite strange to its age. No one would dream that it was begun in the thunder of the Battle of Verd. I thought out these problems on cold September nights beneath the walls of Metz in the midst of my duties as a nurse to the wounded. It would be easier to think that it was written fifty years earlier. Its attitude towards politics is one of indifference, un-German, as people would say today. Translator's note. Those Germans who, like Nietzsche or Goethe, recognize that politics constitute a danger to culture, 
and who appreciate the literature of mature cultures such as that of france are called undeutsch ungerman by imperialistic germans End translator's note it smells offensively of hegel only in one or two formulae is it infected with a bitter odour of corpses which is peculiar to schopenhauer an idea the antagonism of the two concepts dionysian and apollonian is translated into metaphysics history itself is depicted as the development of this idea in tragedy this antithesis has become unity from this standpoint things which theretofore have never been face to face are suddenly confronted and understood and illuminated by each other opera and revolution for instance the two decisive innovations in the book are first the comprehension of the dionysian phenomenon among the greeks it provides the first psychological analysis of this phenomenon and sees in it the single root of all greek art and secondly the comprehension of socraticism socrates being presented for the first time as the instrument of greek dissolution as a typical decadent reason versus instinct reason at any cost as a dangerous life undermining force the whole book is profoundly and politely silent concerning christianity the latter is neither apollonian nor dionysian it denies all aesthetic value which are the only values that the birth of tragedy recognizes christianity is most profoundly nihilistic whereas in the dionysian symbol the most extreme limits of a yea-saying attitude to life are attained in one part of the book the christian priesthood is referred to as the perfidious order of goblins as subterraneans two this start of mine was remarkable beyond measure as confirmation of my inmost personal experience i had discovered the only example of this fact that history possesses with this i was the first to understand the amazing dionysian phenomenon at the same time by recognizing socrates as a decadent i proved most conclusively that the certainty of my psychological grasp of things ran very little risk at the hands of any sort of moral idiosyncrasy to regard morality itself as a symptom of degeneration is an innovation a unique event of the first order in the history of knowledge how high i had soared above the pitifully foolish gabble about optimism and pessimism with my two new doctrines i was the first to see the actual contrast the degenerate instinct which turns upon life with the subterranean lust of vengeance christianity schopenhauer's philosophy and in some respects too even plato's philosophy in short the whole of idealism in its typical forms as opposed to a formula of the highest yea saying to life born of an abundance and a superabundance of life a yea saying free from all reserve applying even to suffering and guilt and all that is questionable and strange in existence this last most joyous most exuberant and exultant yea to life is not only the highest but also the profoundest conception and one which is most strictly confirmed and supported by truth and science nothing that exists must be suppressed nothing can be dispensed with those aspects of life which christians and other nihilists reject belong to an incalculably higher order in the hierarchy of values than that 
which the instinct of degeneration calls good and may call good in order to understand this a certain courage is necessary and as a prerequisite of this a certain superfluidity of strength for a man can approach only as near to truth as he has the courage to advance that is to say everything depends strictly upon the measure of his strength knowledge and the affirmation of reality are just as necessary to the strong man as cowardice the flight from reality in fact the ideal are necessary to the weak inspired by weakness these people are not at liberty to know decadents stand in need of lies it is one of their self-preservative measures he who not only understands the word dionysian but understands himself in that term does not require any refutation of plato or of christianity or of schopenhauer for his nose scents decomposition three the extent to which i had by means of these doctrines discovered the idea of tragedy the ultimate explanation of what the psychology of tragedy is i discussed finally in the twilight of the idols aphorism five part ten the saying of yea to life and even to its weirdest and most difficult problems the will to life rejoicing at its own infinite vitality in the sacrifice of its highest types that is what i call dionysian that is what i meant as the bridge to the psychology of the tragic poet not to cast out terror and pity or to purge oneself of dangerous passions by discharging it with vehemence this was aristotle's misunderstanding of it translator's note aristotle's poetics chapter six and translator's note but to be far beyond terror and pity and to be the eternal lust of becoming itself that lust which also involves the joy of destruction in this sense i have the right to regard myself as the first tragic philosopher that is to say the most extreme antithesis and antipods of a pessimistic philosopher before my time no such thing existed as this translation of the dionysian phenomenon into philosophic emotion tragic wisdom was lacking in vain have i sought for signs of it even among the great greeks in philosophy those belonging to the two centuries before socrates i still remained a little doubtful about heraclitus in whose presence alone i felt warmer and more at ease than anywhere else the yea saying to the impermanence and annihilation of things which is the decisive feature of dionysian philosophy the yea saying to contradiction and war the postulation of becoming together with a radical rejection even of the concept being in all these things at all events i must recognize him who has come nearest to me in thought hitherto the doctrine of the eternal recurrence that is to say of the absolute and eternal repetition of all things in periodical cycles this doctrine of zarathustra's might it is true have been taught before in any case the stoics who derive nearly all the fundamental ideas from heraclitus show traces of it four a tremendous hope finds expression in this work after all i have absolutely no reason to renounce the hope for a dionysian future of music let us look a century ahead and let us suppose that my attempt to destroy two millenniums of hostility to nature and of the violation of humanity be crowned with success that new party of life advocates 
which will undertake the greatest of all tasks the elevation and perfection of mankind as well as the relentless destruction of all degenerate and parasitical elements will make that superabundance of life on earth once more possible out of which the Dionysian state will perforce arise again i promise the advent of a tragic age the highest art in the saying of yea to life tragedy will be born again when mankind has the knowledge of the hardest but most necessary of wars behind it without however suffering from that knowledge a psychologist might add that what i heard in wagnerian music in my youth and early manhood have nothing whatsoever to do with wagner that when i described dionysian music i described merely what i personally had heard that i was compelled instinctively to translate and transfigure everything into the new spirit which filled my breast a proof of this and as strong a proof as you could have is my essay wagner in byright in all its decisive psychological passages i am the only person concerned without any hesitation you may read my name or the word zarathustra wherever the text contains the name of wagner the whole panorama of the diathrambic artist is the representation of the already existing author of zarathustra and it is drawn with an abysmal depth which does not even once come into contact with the real wagner wagner himself had a notion of this truth he did not recognize himself in the essay in this way the idea of byright was changed into something which to those who are acquainted with my zarathustra will be no riddle that is to say into the great noon when the highest of the elect will consecrate themselves for the greatest of all duties who knows the vision of a feast which i may live to see the pathos of the first few pages is universal history the look the look which is discussed on page 105 of the book is the actual look of zarathustra translator's footnote this number and those which follow refers to the thoughts out of season part one in this edition of nietzsche's works and translator's note wagner bayreuth the whole of this petty german wretchedness is a cloud upon which an infinite fata morgana of the future is reflected even from the psychological standpoint all the decisive traits in my character are introduced into wagner's nature the juxtaposition of the most brilliant and most fatal forces a will to power such as no man has ever possessed inexorable bravery in matters spiritual an unlimited power of learning unaccompanied by depressed powers for action everything in this essay is a prophecy the proximity of the resurrection of the greek spirit the need of men who will be counter alexanders who will once more tie the gordian knot of greek culture after it has been cut listen to the world historic accent with which the concept sense for the tragic is introduced on page 108 there are little else but world historic accents in this essay this is the strangest kind of objectivity that ever existed by absolute certainty in regard to what i am projected itself into any chance reality truth about myself was voiced from out appalling depths on pages 174 and 175 the style of zarathustra is described and foretold with incisive certainty 
and no more magnificent expression will ever be found than that on pages 144 to 147, for the event for which Zarathustra stands, that prodigious act of the purification and consecration of mankind. Thoughts Out of Season 1. The four essays composing the Thoughts Out of Season are thoroughly warlike in tone. They prove that I was no mere dreamer, that I delight in drawing the sword. And perhaps also that my wrist is dangerously supple. The first onslaught, 1873, was directed against German culture, upon which I looked down even at that time with unmitigated contempt. Without either sense, substance, or goal, it was simply public opinion. There could be no more dangerous misunderstanding than to suppose that German's success at arms proved anything in favour of German culture, and still less the triumph of this culture over that of France. The second essay, 1874, brings to light that which is dangerous, that which corrodes and poisons life in our manner of pursuing scientific study. Life is diseased thanks to this dehumanized piece of clockwork and mechanism, thanks to the impersonality of the workman and the false economy of the division of labor. The object, which is culture, is lost sight of. Modern scientific activity, as a means thereto, simply produces barbarism. In this treatise, the historical sense of which this century is so proud is for the first time recognized as sickness, as a typical symptom of decay. In the third and fourth essays, a signpost is set up pointing to a higher concept of culture, to a re-establishment of the notion culture, and two pictures of the hardest self-love and self-discipline are presented, two essentially unmodern types, full of the most sovereign contempt for all that which lay around them and was called empire, culture, Christianity, Bismarck, and success. These two types were Schopenhauer and Wagner, or, in a word, Nietzsche. 2. Of these four attacks, the first met with extraordinary success. The stir which it created was in every way gorgeous. I had put my finger on the vulnerable spot of a triumphant nation. I have told it that its victory was not a red-letter day for culture, but perhaps something very different. The reply rang out from all sides, and certainly not from old friends of David Strauss, whom I had made ridiculous as the type of the German Philistine of culture, and a man of smug self-content, in short, as the author of that subterranean gospel of his called The Old and the New Faith, the term Philistine of culture passed into the current language of Germany after the appearance of my book. These old friends, whose vanity as Württembergians and Swabians, I had deeply wounded in regarding their unique animal, their bird of paradise, as a trifle comic, replied to me as ingenuously and as grossly as I could have wished the Prussian replies were smarter. They contained more Prussian blue. The most disreputable attitude was assumed by a Leipzig paper, the egregious Gretzborden, and it cost me some pains to prevent my indignant friends at Bala from taking action against it. Only a few gentlemen decided in my favour, and for very diverse and sometimes unaccountable reasons. Among them was one Edward of Göttingen, 
who made it clear that my attacks on Strauss had been deadly. There was also the Heglian Bruno Bauer, who from that time became one of my most attentive readers. In his later years, he liked to refer to me when, for instance, he wanted to give Herr von Treiske, the Prussian historiographer, a hint as to where he could obtain information about the notion culture of which he, Herr von T, had completely lost sight. The weightiest and longest notice of my book and its author appeared in Würzburg and was written by Professor Hoffmann, an old pupil of the philosopher von Bauda. The essays made him foresee a great future for me, namely, that of bringing about a sort of crisis and decisive turning point in the problem of atheism, of which he recognized in me the most instinctive and most radical advocate. It was atheism that had drawn me to Schopenhauer. The review which received by far the most attention, and which excited the most bitterness, was an extraordinarily powerful and plucky appreciation of my work by Karl Hillebrand a man who was usually so mild, and the last humane German who knew how to wield a pen. The article appeared in the Augsburg Gazette, and can be read today, couched in rather more cautious language, among his collective essays. In it my work is referred to as an event, as a decisive turning point, as the first sign of an awakening, as an excellent symptom as an actual revival of German earnestness and of German passion in things spiritual. Hillebrand could speak only in the terms of the highest respect, of the form of my book, of its consummate taste, of its perfect tact in discriminating between persons and causes. He characterized it as the best polemical work in the German language the best performance in the art of polemics, for which Germans is so dangerous and so strongly to be depreciated. Besides confirming my standpoint, he laid even greater stress upon what I had dared to say about the deterioration of language in Germany. Nowadays writers assume the airs of purists and can no longer even construct a sentence. Translator's footnote the purists constitute a definite body in Germany, which is called the Deutsche Sprachwerin. Their object is to banish every foreign word from the language, and they carry this process of ostracism even into the domain of the menu, where their efforts at rendering the meaning of French dishes are extremely comical. Strange to say, their principal organ and their other publications are by no means free either from solecisms or faults of style, and it is doubtless to this curious anomaly that Nietzsche here refers. End translator's footnote. Sharing my contempt for the literary stars of this nation, he concluded by expressing his admiration for my courage, that greatest courage of all which places the very favourites of the people in the dock. The after-effects of this essay of mine proved invaluable to me in my life. No one has ever tried to meddle with me since. People are silent. In Germany I am treated with gloomy caution. For years I have rejoiced in the privilege of such absolute freedom of speech as no one nowadays least of all in the empire, has enough liberty to claim. My paradise is in the shadow of my sword. At bottom all I had done was to put one of Senhal's maxims into practice. He advises one to make one's entrance into society by means of a duel. And how well I had chosen my opponent, the foremost free thinker of Germany. As a matter of fact, Quite a novel kind of free thought found its expression in this way. Up to the present, nothing has been more strange and more foreign to my blood than the whole of that European and American species known as libre penseur. 
incorrigible blockheads and clowns of modern ideas that they are. I feel much more profoundly at variance with them than with any one of their adversaries. They also wish to improve mankind after their own fashion, that is to say, in their own image, against that which I stand for and desire. They would wage an implacable war, if only they understood it. The whole gang of them still believe in an ideal. I am the first immoralist. 3. I should not like to say that the last two essays in the Thoughts Out of Season, associated with the names of Schopenhauer and Wagner respectively, serve any special purpose in throwing light upon these two cases, or in formulating their psychological problems. This, of course, does not apply to a few details. Thus, for instance, in the second of the two essays, with a profound certainty of instinct, I already characterized the elementary factor in Wagner's nature as a theatrical talent which in all his means and inspirations only draws its final conclusions. At bottom, my desire in this essay was to do something very different from writing psychology, an unprecedented educational problem. A new understanding of self-discipline and self-defense carried to the point of hardness, a road to greatness and to world-historic duties yearned to find expression. Roughly speaking, I seized two famous, and, theretofore, completely undefined types by the forelock, after the manner in which one seizes opportunities, simply in order to speak my mind on certain questions, in order to have a few more formulas, signs and means of expression at my disposal. Indeed, I actually suggest this with the most unearthly sagacity, on page 183 of Schopenhauer as Educator. Plato made use of Socrates in the same way, that is to say, as a cipher for Plato. Now that, from some distance, I can look back upon the conditions of which these essays are the testimony, I would be loath to deny that they refer simply to me. The essay, Wagner in Bayreuth, is a vision of my own future. On the other hand, my most secret history, my development, is written down in Schopenhauer as educator. But, above all, the vow I made. What I am today, the place I now hold, at a height from which I speak no longer with words, but with thunderbolts, Oh, how far I was from all this in those days! But I saw the land. I did not deceive myself one moment as to the way, the sea, the danger, and success. The great calm in promising, this happy prospect of a future which must not remain only a promise. In this book, every word has been lived profoundly and intimately. The most painful things are not lacking in it. It contains words which are positively running with blood. But a wind of great freedom blows over the whole. Even its wounds do not constitute an objection. As to what I understand by being a philosopher, that is to say, the terrible explosive, in the presence of which everything is in danger. As to how I sever my idea, of the philosopher by miles from that other idea of him which includes even a kant not to speak of the academic ruminators and other professors of philosophy concerning all these things this essay provides invaluable information even granting that at bottom it is not schopenhauer as educator but nietzsche as educator who speaks his sentiments in it Considering that, in those days my trade was that of a scholar, and perhaps also that I understood my trade, the piece of austere scholar psychology, 
which suddenly makes its appearance in this essay is not without importance it expresses the feeling of distance and my profound certainty regarding what was my real life task and what was merely means intervals and accessory work to me my wisdom consists in my having been many things and in many places in order to become one thing in order to be able to attain to one thing it was part of my fate to be a scholar for a while end of why i write such excellent books part one chapter three part two of ecce homo by friedrich nietzsche translated by antony m ludovici why i write such excellent books part two human all too human one human all too human with its two sequels is a memorial of a crisis it is called a book for free spirits almost every sentence in it is the expression of a triumph by means of it i purged myself of everything in me which was foreign to my nature idealism is foreign to me the title of the book means where ye see ideal things i see human alas all too human things i know men better the word free spirit in this book must not be understood as anything else than a spirit that has become free that has once more taken possession of itself my tone the pitch of my voice has completely changed the book will be thought clever cool and at times both hard and scornful a certain spirituality of noble tastes seems to be ever struggling to dominate a passionate torrent at its feet in this respect there is some sense in the fact that it was the hundredth anniversary of voltaire's death that served so to speak as an excuse for the publication of the book as early as eighteen seventy eight for voltaire as the opposite of every one who wrote after him was above all a grandee of the intellect precisely what i am also the name of voltaire on one of my writings that was verily a step forwards in my direction looking into this book a little more closely you perceive a pitiless spirit who knows all the secret hiding places in which ideals are wont to skulk where they find their dungeons and as it were their last refuge with a torch in my hand the light of which is not by any means a flickering one i illuminate this nether world with beams that cut like blades it is war but war without powder and smoke without warlike attitudes without pathos and contorted limbs all these things would still be idealism one error after another is quietly laid upon ice the ideal is not refuted it freezes here for instance genius freezes around the corner the saint freezes under a thick icicle the hero freezes and in the end faith itself freezes so-called conviction and also pity are considerably cooled and almost everywhere the thing in itself is freezing to death two this book was begun during the first musical festival at Bayreuth. a feeling of profound strangeness towards everything that surrounded me there is one of its first conditions he who has any notion of the visions which even at that time had flitted across my path will be able to guess what i felt when one day i came to my senses in Bayreuth. It was just as if I had been dreaming. Where on earth was I? I recognized nothing that I saw. 
I scarcely recognized Wagner. It was in vain that I called up reminiscences. Tribschen, the remote island of bliss, not the shadow of a resemblance. The incomparable days devoted to the laying of the first stone, the small group of initiates who celebrated them, and who were far from lacking fingers for the handling of delicate things, not the shadow of a resemblance. What had happened? Wagner had been translated into German. The Wagnerite had become master of Wagner. German art. The German master. German beer. We who know only too well the kind of refined artists and cosmopolitanism in taste, to which alone Wagner's art can appeal, were besides ourselves at the sight of Wagner bedecked with German virtues. I think I know the Wagnerite. I have experienced three generations of them, from Brendel of blessed memory, who confounded Wagner with Hegel, to the idealists of Bayreuth Gazette, who confounded Wagner with themselves. I have been the recipient of every kind of confession about Wagner from beautiful souls. My kingdom for just one intelligent word. In very truth, a blood-curdling company. Knoll, Pole, and Coal, and others of their kidney to infinity. Translator's footnote. Knoll and Pole were both writers on music. Coal, however, which literally means cabbage, is slang expression denoting superior nonsense. End translator's note. There was not a single abortion that was lacking among them. No, not even the anti-Semite, poor Wagner. Into whose hands had he fallen? If only he had gone into a herd of swine. But among Germans, some day, for the edification of posterity, one ought really to have a genuine Bayreuthian stuffed, or better still, preserved in spirit for it is precisely spirit that is lacking in this quarter, with this inscription at the foot of the jar, a sample of the spirit whereon the German Empire was founded. But enough. In the middle of festivities I suddenly packed my trunk and left the place for a few weeks, despite the fact that a charming Parisian lady sought to comfort me. I excused myself to Wagner simply by means of a fatalistic telegram in a little spot called Klingenbrung, deeply buried in the recesses of the Böhmerwald. I carried my melancholy and my contempt for Germans about with me like an illness. And, from time to time, under the general title of the Plowshare, I wrote a sentence or two down in my notebooks, nothing but severe psychological stuff, which, it is possible, may have found its way into human all too human. 3. That which had taken place in me, then, was not only a breach with Wagner. I was suffering from a general aberration of my instincts, of which it mere isolated blunder, whether it were Wagner or my professorship at Bala, was nothing more than a symptom. I was seized with a fit of impatience with myself. I saw that it was high time that I should turn my thoughts upon my own lot. In a thrice I realized with appalling clearness how much time had already been squandered, how futile and how senseless my whole existence as a philologist appeared by the side of my life task. I was ashamed of this false modesty. Ten years were behind me, during which, to tell the truth, the nourishment of my spirit had been at a standstill, during which I had added not a single useful fragment to my knowledge, and had forgotten countless things in the pursuit of a hotchpotch of dry-as-dust scholarship. To crawl with meticulous care and short-sighted eyes through old Greek metricans, that is what I had come to. Moved to pity, I saw myself quite thin, quite emaciated. Realities were only too plainly absent from my stock of knowledge, 
and what the ideal it is were worth the devil alone knew a positively burning thirst overcame me and from that time forward i had done literally nothing else than study psychology medicine and natural science i even returned to the actual study of history only when my life task compelled me to it was at that time too that i first divined the relation between the instinctively repulsive occupation a so-called vocation which is the last thing to which one is called and that need of lulling a feeling of emptiness and hunger by means of an art which is a narcotic by means of a wagner's art for instance after looking carefully about me i have discovered that a large number of young men are all in the same state of distress one kind of unnatural practice perforce leads to another in germany or rather to avoid all ambiguity in the empire only too many are condemned to determine their choice too soon and then to pine away beneath a burden that they can no longer throw off translator's footnote needless to say nietzsche distinguishes between bismarckian germany and that other germany austria switzerland and the baltic provinces where the german language is also spoken end of translator's note such creatures crave for wagner as for an opate they are thus able to forget themselves to be rid of themselves for a moment what, what am i saying for five or six hours four at this time my instincts turn resolutely against any further yielding or following on my part and any further misunderstanding of myself every kind of life the most unfavorable circumstances illness poverty anything seemed to me preferable to that undignified selfishness into which i had fallen in the first place thanks to my ignorance and youth and in which i had afterwards remained owing to laziness the so-called sense of duty at this juncture there came to my help in a way that i cannot sufficiently admire and precisely at the right time that evil heritage which i derive from my father's side of the family and which at bottom is no more than a predisposition to die young illness slowly liberated me from the toils it spared me any sort of sudden breach any sort of violent and offensive step at that time i lost not a particle of the good will of others but rather added to my store illness likewise gave me the right completely to reverse my mode of life it not only allowed it actually commanded me to forget it bestowed upon me the necessity of lying still of having leisure of waiting and of exercising patience but all this means thinking the state of my eyes alone put an end to all book wormishness or in plain english philology i was thus delivered from books for years i ceased from reading and this was the greatest boon i ever conferred upon myself that nethermost self which was as it were entombed and which had grown dumb because it had been forced to listen perpetually to other selves for that is what reading means slowly awakened at first it was shy and doubtful but at last it spoke again never have i rejoiced more over my condition than during the sickest and most painful moments of my life you have only to examine the dawn of day or perhaps the wanderer and his shadow translator's footnote human all to human part two in this edition end translator's footnote in order to understand what this return to myself actually meant in itself it was the highest kind of recovery my cure was simply the result of it five human all too human 
this monument of a course of vigorous self-discipline by means of which i put an abrupt end to all the superior bunkum idealism beautiful feelings and other effeminacies that had percolated into my being was written principally in sorrento it was finished and given definitive shape during a winter at bala under conditions far less favourable than those in sorrento truth to tell it was peter gast at that time a student at the university of bala and a devoted friend of mine who was responsible for the book with my head wrapped in bandages and extremely painful i dictated while he wrote and corrected as he went along to be accurate he was the real composer whereas i was only the author when the completed book ultimately reached me to the great surprise of the serious invalid i then was i sent among others two copies to byright thanks to a miraculous flash of intelligence on the part of chance there reached me precisely at the same time a splendid copy of the parsifal text with the following inscription from wagner's pen to his dear friend friedrich nietzsche from richard wagner ecclesiastical counsellor at this crossing of the two books i seemed to hear an ominous note did it not sound as if two swords had crossed at all events we both felt this was so for each of us remained silent at about this time the first bayreuth pamphlets appeared and then i understood the move on my part for which it was high time incredible wagner had become pious six my attitude to myself at that time eighteen seventy six and the unearthly certitude with which i grasped my life task and all its world historical consequences is well revealed throughout the book but more particularly in one very significant passage despite the fact that with my instinctive cunning i once more circumvented the use of the little word i not however this time in order to shed world historic glory on the names of schopenhauer and wagner but that on another of my friends the excellent dr paul Rhee, fortunately much too acute a creature to be deceived others were less subtle among my readers i have a number of hopeless people the typical german professor for instance who can always be recognized from the fact that judging from the passage in question he feels compelled to regard the whole book as a sort of superior realism as a matter of fact it contradicts five or six of my friend's utterances only read the introduction to the genealogy of morals on this question the passage above referred to reads what after all is the principal axiom to which the boldest and coldest thinker the author of the book on the origin of moral sensations read nietzsche the first immoralist has attained by means of his incisive and decisive analysis of human actions the moral man he says is no nearer to the intelligible metaphysical world than the physical man for there is no intelligible world this theory hardened and sharpened under the hammer blow of historical knowledge read the transvaluation of all values may some time or other perhaps in some future period eighteen ninety serve as the axe which is applied to the root of the metaphysical need of man whether more as a blessing than a curse to the general welfare it is not easy to say but in any case as a theory with the most important consequences at once fruitful and terrible and looking into the world with that janus face which all great knowledge possesses translator's footnote human all too human volume one aphorism thirty seven end translator's footnote the dawn of day 
Thoughts about morality as a prejudice. 1. With this book I open my campaign against morality. Not that it is at all redolent of powder. You will find quite another and much nicer smells in it, provided that you have any keenness in your nostrils. There is nothing either of light or of heavy artillery in its composition. And if its general end be a negative one, its means are not so. Means out of which the end follows like a logical conclusion, not like a cannon shot. And if the reader takes leave of this book with the feeling of timid caution in regard to everything which has hitherto been honoured and even worshipped under the name of morality, it does not alter the fact that there is not one negative word, not one attack, and not one single piece of malice in the whole work. On the contrary, it lies in the sunshine, smooth and happy, like a marine animal, basking in the sun between two rocks. For, after all, I was this marine animal. Almost every sentence in the book was thought out, or rather caught, among that medley of rocks in the neighbourhood of Genoa, where I lived quite alone and exchanged secrets with the ocean. Even to this day, when by chance I happen to turn over the leaves of this book, almost every sentence seems to me like a hook by means of which I draw something incomparable out of the depths. Its whole skin quivers with delicate shudders of recollection. This book is conspicuous for no little art in gently catching things which whisk rapidly and silently away, moments which I call godlike lizards, not with the cruelty of that young Greek god who simply transfixed the poor little beast, but nevertheless with something pointed, with a pen. There are so many dawns which have not yet shed their light. This Indian maxim is written over the doorway of this book. Where does its author seek that new morning, that delicate red, as yet undiscovered, with which another day, ah, the whole series of days, a whole world of new days, will begin? In the transvaluation of all values, in an emancipation from all moral values, in a saying of yea, and in an attitude of trust to all that which hitherto has been forbidden, despised, and damned. This yea-saying book projects its light, its love, its tenderness, over all evil things. It restores to them their soul, their clear conscience, and their superior right and privilege to exist on earth. Morality is not assailed, it simply ceases to be considered. This book closes with a word, or. It is the only book which closes with an or. 2. My life task is to prepare for humanity one supreme moment in which it can come to its senses, a great noon in which it will turn its gaze backwards and forwards, in which it will step from under the yoke of accident and of priests, and for the first time set the questions of the why and wherefore of humanity as a whole. This life task naturally follows out of the conviction that mankind does not get on the right road of its own accord, that it is by no means divinely ruled, but rather that it is precisely under the cover of its most holy valuations that the instinct of negation, of corruption, and of degeneration have held such a seductive sway. The question concerning the origin of moral valuations is therefore a matter of the highest importance to me, because it determines the future of mankind. The demand made upon us to believe that everything is really in the best hands, that a certain book, the Bible, gives us the definite and comforting assurance that there is a providence that wisely rules the fate of man. 
when translated back into reality, amounts simply to this, namely, the will to stifle the truth, which maintains the reverse of all this, which is that hitherto man has been in the worst possible hands, and that he has been governed by the physiologically botched, the men of cunning and burning revengefulness, and the so-called saints, those slanderers of the world and traducers of humanity. The definite proof of the fact that the priest, including the priest in disguise, the philosopher, has become master, not only within a certain limited religious community, but everywhere, and that the morality of decadence, the will to non-entity, has become morality per se, is to be found in this, that altruism is now an absolute value, and egotism is regarded with hostility everywhere. He who disagrees with me on this point I regard as infected. But all the world disagrees with me. To a psychologist like antagonism between values admits of no doubt. If the most insignificant organ within the body neglects, however slightly, to assert with absolute certainty its self-preservative powers, its recuperative claims, and its egotism, the whole system degenerates. The psychologist insists upon the removal of degenerated parts. He denies all fellow feelings for such parts, and has not the smallest feeling of pity for them. But the desire of the priest is precisely the degeneration of the whole of mankind. Hence his preservation of that which is degenerate. This is what his dominion costs humanity. What meaning have those lying concepts whose handmaids of morality, soul, spirit, free will, God, if their aim is not the physiological ruin of mankind? When earnestness is diverted from the instincts that aim at self-preservation and an increase of bodily energy, i.e., at an increase of life, when anemia is raised to an ideal, and the contempt of the body is construed as the salvation of the soul, what is all this if it is not a recipe for decadence? Loss of ballast, resistance offered to natural instincts, selflessness, in fact, this is what has hitherto been known as morality. With the dawn of day, I first engaged in a struggle against the morality of self-renunciation. Joyful Wisdom, La Gaia Scienza 1. Dawn of Day is a yea-saying book, profound but clear and kindly. The same applies once more and in the highest degree to La Gaia Scienza. In almost every sentence of this book, profundity and playfulness go gently hand in hand. A verse which expresses my gratitude for the most wonderful month of January which I have ever lived, the whole book is a gift, sufficiently reveals the abysmal depths from which wisdom has here become joyful. Thou, who with cleaving fiery lances, the stream of my soul from its ice doth free, till with a rush and a roar it advances, to enter with glorious hoping the sea, brighter to see and purer ever, free in the bonds of thy sweet constraint, so it praises thy wondrous endeavour. January, thou beauteous saint. Translator's Note Translated for Joyful Wisdom by Paul V. Cohen. End translator's note. Who can here be in any doubt as to what glorious hoping means here? When he has realized the diamond beauty of the first of Zarathustra's words as they appear in the glow of light at the close of the fourth book, or when he reads the granite sentences at the end of the third book, wherein a fate for all times is first given a formula? The songs of Prince Free as a Bird, which, 
for the most part were written in Sicily, remind me quite forcibly of that Provencal notion of Gaia Scienza, of that union of singer, knight, and free spirit, which distinguishes that wonderfully early culture of the Provençals from all ambiguous cultures. The last poem of all, To the Mistral, is an exuberant dance song in which, if you please, the new spirit dances freely upon the corpse of morality. Is a perfect Provençalism. Thus spake Zarathustra, a book for all and none. 1. I now wish to relate the history of Zarathustra. The fundamental idea of the work, the eternal recurrence, the highest formula of a yea saying to life that can ever be attained, was first conceived in the month of August 1881. I made a note of the idea on a sheet of paper, with the postscript, Six thousand feet beyond man and time. That day, I happened to be wandering through the woods, alongside the lake of Silver Plana, and I halted not far from Surly, beside a huge rock that towered aloft like a pyramid. It was then that the thought struck me. Looking back now, I find that exactly two months before this inspiration I had an omen of its coming in the form of a sudden and decisive change in my tastes more particularly in music. The whole of Zarathustra might, perhaps, be classified under the rubric music. At all events, the essential condition of its production was a second birth within me of the art of hearing. In Recraro, a small mountain resort near Vicenza, where I spent the spring of 1881, I and my friend and maestro, Peter Gast, who was also one who had been born again, discovered that the phoenix music hovered over us, in lighter and brighter plumage than it had ever worn before. If, therefore, I now calculated from that day forward the sudden production of the book, under the most unlikely circumstances, in February 1883, the last part out of which I quoted a few lines in my preface, was written precisely in the hallowed hour when Richard Wagner gave up the ghost in Venice. I come to the conclusion that the period of gestation covered eighteen months. This period of exactly eighteen months might suggest, at least to Buddhists, that I am in reality a female elephant. The interval was devoted to the Gaia Scienza, which contains hundreds of indications of the proximity of something unparalleled, for, after all, it shows the beginning of Zarathustra, since it presents Zarathustra's fundamental thought in the last aphorism but one of the fourth book. To this interval also belongs that hymn to life for a mixed choir and orchestra, the score of which was published in Leipzig two years ago by E. V. Fritsch, and which gave perhaps no slight indication of my spiritual state during this year, in which the essentially yea-saying pathos, which I call the tragic pathos, completely filled me heart and limb. One day people will sing it to my memory. The text let it be well understood, as there is some misunderstanding abroad on this point, is not by me. It was the astounding inspiration of a young Russian lady, Miss Lou von Salome, with whom I was then on friendly terms. He, who is in any way able to make sense of the last words of the poem, will divine why I preferred and admired it. There is greatness in them. Pain is not regarded as an objection to existence. And if thou hast no bliss left to crown me, lead on, thou hast thy sorrow still. Maybe that my music 
is also great in this passage. The last note of the oboe, by the by, is C-sharp, not C. The latter is a misprint. During the following winter, I was living on that charming, peaceful gulf of Rapallo, not far from Genoa, which cuts inland between Caivari and Cape Portofino. My health was not very good. The winter was cold and exceptionally rainy. And the small albergo in which I lived was so close to the water that at night my sleep was disturbed if the sea was rough. These circumstances were surely the very reverse of favourable. And yet, in spite of it all, and as if in proof of my belief that everything decisive comes to life in defiance of every obstacle, it was precisely during this winter and in the midst of these unfavourable circumstances that my Zarathustra originated. In the morning I used to start out in a southerly direction up the glorious road to Zwali, which rises up through a forest of pines and gives one a view far out to sea. In the afternoon, or as often as my health allowed, I walked round the whole bay from St. Margarita to beyond Portofino. This spot affected me all the more deeply because it was so dearly loved by the Emperor Frederick the Third. In the autumn of 1886, I chanced to be there again, when he was revisiting this small forgotten world of happiness for the last time. It was on these two roads that all Zarathustra came to me, above all, Zarathustra himself as a type. I ought rather to say that it was on these walks that he waylaid me. 2. In order to understand this type, you must first be quite clear concerning its fundamental physiological condition. This condition is what I call great healthiness. In regard to this idea, I cannot make my meaning more plain or more personal than I have already done in one of the last aphorisms, number 382, of the fifth book of the Gaia Scienza. We knew, nameless and unfathomable creatures, so reads the passage, we firstlings of a future still unproved. We, who have a new end in view, also require new means to that end, that is to say, a new healthiness, a stronger, keener, tougher, bolder and merrier healthiness than any that has existed heretofore. He who longs to feel in his own soul the whole range of values and aims that have prevailed on earth until his day, and to sail around all the coasts of this ideal Mediterranean Sea, who, from the adventures of his own inmost experience, would fain know how it feels to be a conqueror and a discoverer of the ideal, as also how it is, with the artist, the saint, the legislator, the sage, the scholar, the man of piety and the godlike anchorite of yore. Such a man requires one thing above all for his purpose, and that is great healthiness. Such healthiness as he not only possesses, but also constantly acquires and must acquire because he is continually sacrificing it again, and is compelled to sacrifice it. And now, therefore, after having been long on the way, we Argonauts of the ideal, whose pluck is greater than prudence would allow, and who are often shipwrecked and bruised, but, as I have said, healthier than people would like to admit, dangerously healthy, and forever recovering our health, it would seem as if we had before us, as a reward for all our toils, a country still undiscovered, the horizon of which no one has yet seen, a beyond to every country, and every refuge of the ideal that man has ever known, a world so overflowing with beauty, strangeness, doubt, terror, and divinity, that both our curiosity and our lust of possession are frantic with eagerness. Alas, 
how in the face of such vistas and with such burning desire in our conscience and consciousness could we still be content with the man of the present day this is bad indeed but that we should regard his worthiest aims and hopes with ill-concealed amusement or perhaps give them no thought at all is inevitable another ideal now leads us on a wonderful seductive ideal full of danger the pursuit of which we should be loath to urge upon any one because we are not so ready to acknowledge any one's right to it the ideal of a spirit who plays ingeniously that is to say involuntarily and as the outcome of superabundant energy and power with everything that hitherto has been called holy good inviolable and divine to whom even the loftiest thing that the people have with reason made their measure of value would be no better than a danger a decay and an abasement or at least a relaxation and temporary forgetfulness of self the ideal of humanly superhuman well-being and goodwill which often enough will seem inhuman as when for instance it stands beside all past earnestness on earth and all past solemnities in hearing speech tone look morality and duty as their most lifelike and unconscious parody but with which nevertheless great earnestness perhaps alone begins the first note of interrogation is affixed the fate of the soul changes the hour hand moves and tragedy begins three has any one at the end of the nineteenth century any distinct notion of what poets of a strong age understood by the word inspiration if not i will describe it if one had the smallest vestige of superstition left in one it would hardly be possible completely to set aside the idea that one is the mere incarnation mouthpiece or medium of an almighty power the idea of revelation in the sense that something which profoundly convulses and upsets one becomes suddenly visible and audible with indescribable certainty and accuracy describes the simple fact one hears one does not seek one takes one does not ask who gives a thought suddenly flashes up like lightning it comes with necessity without faltering i have never had any choice in the matter there is an ecstasy so great that the immense strain of it is sometimes relaxed by a flood of tears during which one's steps now involuntarily rush and anon involuntarily lag there is the feeling that one is utterly out of hand with the very distinct consciousness of an endless number of fine thrills and titillations descending to one's very toes there is a depth of happiness in which the most painful and gloomy paths do not act as antitheses to the rest but are produced and required as necessary shades of colour in such an overflow of light there is an instinct for rhythmic relations which embraces a whole world of forms length the need of a wide embracing rhythm is almost the measure of the force of an inspiration a sort of counterpart to its pressure and tension everything happens quite involuntarily as if in a tempestuous outburst of freedom of absoluteness of power and divinity the involuntary nature of the figures and similes is the most remarkable thing one loses all perception of what is imagery and metaphor everything seems to present itself as the readiest the truest and simplest means of expression 
it actually seems to use one of zarathustra's own phrases as if all things came to one and offered themselves as similes here do all things come caressingly to thy discourse and flatter thee for they would fain ride upon thy back on every simile thou ridest here unto every truth here fly open unto thee all the speech and word shrines of the world here would all existence become speech here would all becoming learn of thee how to speak this is my experience of inspiration i do not doubt but that i should have to go back thousands of years before i could find another who could say to me it is mine also four for a few weeks afterwards i lay an invalid in genoa then followed a melancholy spring in rome where i only just managed to live and this was no easy matter this city which is absolutely unsuited to the poet author of zarathustra and for the choice of which i was not responsible made me inordinately miserable i tried to leave it i wanted to go to aquila the opposite of rome in every respect and actually found it in a spirit of hostility towards that city just as i also shall found a city some day as a memento of an atheist and a genuine enemy of the church a person very closely related to me the great hohenstaufen the emperor frederick the second but fate lay behind it all i had to return again to rome in the end i was obliged to be satisfied with the piazza barberini after i had exerted myself in vain to find an anti-christian quarter i fear that on one occasion to avoid bad smells as much as possible i actually inquired at the palazzo del curinali whether they could not provide a quiet room for a philosopher in a chamber high above the piazza just mentioned from which one obtained a general view of rome and could hear the fountains plashing far below the loneliest of all songs was composed the night song about this time i was obsessed by an unspeakably sad melody the refrain of which i recognize in the words dead through immortality in the summer finding myself once more in the sacred place where the first thought of zarathustra flashed like a light across my mind i conceived the second part ten days sufficed neither for the second the first nor the third parts have I required a day longer in the ensuing winter beneath the halicon sky of nice which then for the first time poured its light into my life i found the third zarathustra and came to the end of my task the whole having occupied me scarcely a year many hidden corners and heights in the country round about nice are hallowed for me by moments that i can never forget that decisive chapter entitled old and new tables was composed during the arduous ascent from the station to etza that wonderful moorish village in the rocks during those moments when my creative energy flowed most plentifully my muscular activity was always greatest the body is inspired let us waive the question of soul i might often have been seen dancing in those days and could then walk for seven or eight hours on end over the hills without a suggestion of fatigue i slept well and laughed a good deal i was perfectly robust and patient five with the exception of these periods of industry lasting ten days the years i spent during the production of zarathustra and thereafter were for me years of unparalleled distress a man pays dearly for being immortal 
to this end he must die many times over during his life there is such a thing as what i call the rancor of greatness everything great whether a work or a deed once it is completed turns immediately against its author the very fact that he is its author makes him weak at this time he can no longer endure his deed he can no longer look it full in the face to have something at once back which one could never have willed something to which the knot of human destiny is attached and to be forced henceforth to bear it on one's shoulders why it almost crushes one the rancor of greatness a somewhat different experience is the uncanny silence that reigns about one solitude has seven skins which nothing can penetrate one goes among men one greets friends but these things are only new deserts the looks of those one meets no longer bears a greeting at the best one encounters a sort of revolt this feeling of revolt i suffered in varying degrees of intensity at the hands of almost every one who came near me it would seem that nothing inflicts a deeper wound than suddenly to make one's distance felt those noble natures are scarce who know not how to live unless they can revere a third thing is the absurd susceptibility of the skin to small pinpricks a kind of helplessness in the presence of all small things this seems to me a necessary outcome of the appalling expenditure of all defensive forces which is the first condition of every creative act of every act which proceeds from the most intimate most secret and most concealed recesses of a man's being the small defensive forces are thus as it were suspended and no fresh energy reaches them i even think it probable that one does not digest so well that one is less willing to move and that one is much too open to sensations of coldness and suspicion for in a large number of cases suspicion is merely a blunder in etiology on one occasion when i felt like this i became conscious of the proximity of a herd of cows some time before i could possibly have seen it with my eyes simply owing to a return in me of milder and more humane sentiments they communicated warmth to me six this work stands alone do not let us mention the poets in the same breath nothing perhaps has ever been produced out of such a superabundance of strength my concept dionysian here became the highest deed compared with it everything that other men have done seems poor and limited the fact that a goethe or a shakespeare would not for an instant have known how to take breath in this atmosphere of passion and of the heights the fact that by the side of zarathustra dante is no more than a believer and not one who first creates the truth that is to say not a world-ruling spirit a fate the fact that the poets of the vida were priests and not even fit to unfasten zarathustra's sandal all this is the least of things and gives no idea of the distance of the azure solitude in which this work dwells zarathustra has an eternal right to say i draw around me circles and holy boundaries ever fewer are they that mount with me to ever loftier heights i build me a mountain range of ever holier mountains if all the spirit and goodness of every great soul were collected together the whole could not create a single one of zarathustra's discourses the ladder upon which he rises and ascends 
is of boundless length. He has seen further, he has willed further, and gone further than any other man. There is contradiction in every word he utters, this most yea-saying of all spirits. Through him all contradictions are bound up into a new unity. The loftiest and the basest powers of human nature, the sweetest, the lightest, and the most terrible, rush forth from out one spring with everlasting certainty. Until his coming, no one knew what was height or depth, and still less what was truth. There is not a single passage in this revelation of truth which had already been anticipated and divined by even the greatest among men. Before Zarathustra, there was no wisdom, no probing of the soul, no art of speech. In his book, the most familiar and most vulgar thing utters unheard of words. The sentence quivers with passion. Eloquence has become music. Forks of lightning are hurled towards futures of which no one has ever dreamed before. The most powerful use of parables that has yet existed is poor beside it, and mere child's play compared with this return of language to the nature of imagery. See how Zarathustra goes down from the mountain and speaks the kindest words to everyone. See with what delicate fingers he touches his very adversaries, the priests, and how he suffers with them from themselves. Here, at every moment, man is overcome, and the concept Superman becomes the greatest reality. Out of sight, almost far away beneath him, lies all that which heretofore has been called great in man. The haloconic brightness the light feet, the presence of wickedness and exuberance throughout. And all that is the essence of the type Zarathustra, was never dreamt of before as a prerequisite of greatness. In precisely these limits of space, and in this accessibility to opposites, Zarathustra feels himself the highest of all living things. And when you hear how he defines this highest, you will give up trying to find his equal. The soul which hath the longest ladder and can step down deepest, the vastest soul that can run and stray and row furthest in its own domain, the most necessary soul that out of desire flingeth itself into chance, the stable soul that plungeth into becoming, the possessing soul that must needs taste of willing and longing, the soul that flieth from itself and overtaketh itself in the widest circle, the wisest soul that folly exhorteth most sweetly, the most self-loving soul in whom all things have their rise, their ebb and flow. But this is the very idea of Dionysus. Another consideration leads to this idea. The psychological problem presented by the type of Zarathustra is, how can he, who in an unprecedented manner says no and acts no, in regard to all that which has been affirmed hitherto, remained nevertheless a yea-saying spirit? How can he, who bears the heaviest destiny on his shoulders, and whose very life task is a fatality, yet be the brightest and the most transcendental of spirits, for Zarathustra is a dancer? How can he, who has the hardest and most terrible grasp of reality, and who has thought the most abysmal thoughts, nevertheless avoid conceiving these things as objections to existence, or even as objections to the eternal recurrence of existence? How is it that on the contrary he finds reasons for being himself 
the eternal affirmation of all things, the tremendous and unlimited saying of yea and amen? Into every abyss do I bear the benediction of my yea to life. But this, once more, is precisely the idea of Dionysus. Seven. What language will such a spirit speak when he speaks unto his soul? The language of the diathram. I am the inventor of the diathram. Hearken unto the manner in which Zarathustra speaks to his soul before sunrise. Part three, forty-eight. Before my time, such emerald joys and divine tenderness had found no tongue. Even the profoundest melancholy of such a Dionysus takes shape as a diathram. As an example of this, I take the night song, the immortal plaint of one who, thanks to his superabundance of light and power, thanks to the sun within him, is condemned never to love. It is night. Now do all gushing springs raise their voices, and my soul too is a gushing spring. Tis night. Now only do all lovers burst into song, and my soul too is the song of a lover. Something unquenched and unquenchable is within me, that would raise its voice. A craving for love is within me, which itself speaketh the language of love. Light am I, would that I were night, but this is my loneliness, that I am brigurt with light. Alas, why am I not dark, and like unto the night? How joyfully would I then suck the breasts of light! And even you would I bless, ye twinkling starlets and glowworms on high, and be blessed in the gifts of your light. But in mine own light do I live. Ever back into myself do I drink the flames I send forth. I know not the happiness of the hand stretched forth to grasp, and oft have I dreamt that stealing must be more blessed than taking. Wretched am I, that my hand may never rest from giving. An envious fate is mine, that I see expectant eyes and nights made bright with longing. Oh, the wretchedness of all them that give! Oh, the clouds that cover the face of my son! That craving for desire, that burning hunger at the end of the feast! They take what I give them, but do I touch their soul? A gulf is there twixt giving and taking, and the smallest gulf is the last to be bridged. An appetite is born from out my beauty. Would that I might do harm to them that I fill with light. Would that I might rob them of the gifts I have given. Thus do I thirst for wickedness, to withdraw my hand, when their hand is already stretched forth like the waterfall that wavers, wavers even in its fall. Thus do I thirst for wickedness. For such vengeance doth my fullness yearn. To such tricks doth my loneliness give birth. My joy in giving died with the deed. But its very fullness did my virtue grow weary of itself. He who giveth risketh to lose his shame. He that is ever distributing groweth callous in hand and heart therefrom. My eyes no longer melt into tears at the sight of the suppliant's shame. My hand hath become too hard to feel the quivering of laden hands. Whither have ye fled? The tears of mine eyes and the bloom of my heart. O oh, the solitude of all givers! O oh, the silence of all beacons! 
Many are the suns that circle in barren space. To all that is dark do they speak with their light. To me alone are they silent. Alas, this is the hatred of light for that which shineth. Pitiless it runneth its course. Unfair in its inmost heart to that which shineth. Cold towards suns, thus doth every sun go its way. Like a tempest do the suns fly over their course, for such is their way. Their own unswerving will do they follow, that is their coldness. Alas, it is ye alone, ye creatures of gloom, ye spirits of the night, that take your warmth from that which shineth. Ye alone suck your milk, and comfort from the udders of light. Alas, about me there is ice, my hand burneth itself against ice. Alas, within me is a thirst that thirsteth for your thirst. It is night, woe to me that I must needs be light, and thirst after darkness, and loneliness. It is night. Now doth my longing burst forth like a spring. For speech do I long, it is night. Now do all gushing springs raise their voices, And my soul too is a gushing spring. It is night. Now only do all lovers burst into song, And my soul too is the song of a lover. 8. Such things have never been written, never been felt, never been suffered. Only a god, only Dionysus suffers in this way. The reply to such a diathram on the sun's solitude in light would be Ariadne. Who knows but I who Ariadne is? To all such riddles, no one heretofore had ever found an answer. I doubt even whether anyone had ever seen a riddle here. One day, Zarathustra severely determines his life task, and it is also mine. Let no one misunderstand its meaning. It is a yea saying to the point of justifying, to the point of redeeming even all that is past. I walk among men as among fragments of the future, of that future which I see. And all my creativeness and effort is but this, that I may be able to think and recast all these fragments and riddles and dismal accidents into one piece. And how could I bear to be a man, if man were not also a poet, a riddle-reader, and a redeemer of chance? to redeem all the past and transform every it was into thus would i have it that alone would be my salvation in another passage he defines as strictly as possible what to him alone man can be not a subject for love nor yet for pity Zarathustra became master even of his loathing of man. Man is to him a thing unshaped, raw material, an ugly stone that needs a sculptor's chisel. No longer to will, no longer to value, no longer to create. Oh, that this great weariness may never be mine. Even in the lust of knowledge, I feel only the joy of my will to beget and to grow. And if there be innocence in my knowledge, it is because my procreative will is in it. Away from God and gods did this will allure me. What would there be to create if there were gods? But to man doth it ever drive me anew, my burning creative will. Thus driveth it the hammer to the stone. Alas, ye men, within the stone there sleepeth an image for me, the image of all my dreams. 
alas, that it should have to sleep in the hardest and ugliest stone. Now rageth my hammer ruthlessly against its prison. From the stone the fragments fly. What's that to me? I will finish it, for a shadow came unto me, the stillest and lightest thing on earth once came unto me. The beauty of the superman came unto me as a shadow. Alas, my brethren, what are the gods to me now? Let me call attention to one last point of view. The line in italics is my pretext for this remark. Narrator's note. The line reads, now rageth my hammer ruthlessly against its prison. End narrator's note. A Dionysian life task needs the hardness of the hammer, and one of its first essentials is without doubt the joy even of destruction, the command, harden yourselves, and the deep conviction that all creators are hard, is the really distinctive sign of a Dionysian nature. End of Why I Write Such Excellent Books, Part 2 Chapter 3, Part 3 of Ecce Homo by Friedrich Nietzsche Translated by Anthony M. Ludovici Why I Write Such Excellent Books, Part 3 Beyond Good and Evil The Prelude to a Philosophy of the Future 1. My work for the years that followed was prescribed as distinctly as possible. Now that the yea saying part of my life task was accomplished, there came the turn of the negative portion, both in word and deed, the transvaluation of all values that had existed hitherto, the great war, the conjuring up of the day when the fatal outcome of the struggle would be decided. Meanwhile, I had slowly to look about me for my peers, for those who, out of strength, would proffer me a helping hand in my work of destruction. From that time onward, all my writings are so much bait. Maybe I understand as much about fishing as most people. If nothing was caught, it was not I who was at fault. There were no fish to come and bite. Two. In all its essential points, this book, 1886, is a criticism of modernity. Embracing the modern sciences, arts, even politics, together with certain indications as to a type which would be the reverse of modern man, or as little like him as possible, a noble and yea-saying type. In this last respect, the book is a school for gentlemen, the term gentleman being understood here in a much more spiritual and radical sense than it has implied hitherto. All those things of which the age is proud, as, for instance, far-famed objectivity, sympathy with all that suffers, the historical sense, with its subjection to foreign tastes, with its lying in the dust before petit fait, and the rage for science, are shown to be the contradiction of the type recommended and are regarded as almost ill-bred. If you remember that this book follows upon Zarathustra, you may possibly guess to what system of diet it owes its life. The eye which, owing to tremendous constraint, has become accustomed to see at a great distance. Zarathustra is even more far-sighted than the Tsar, is here forced to focus sharply that which is close at hand, the present time, the things that lie about him. 
in all the aphorisms and more particularly in the form of this book the reader will find the same voluntary turning away from those instincts which made a zarathustra a possible feat refinement in form in aspiration and in the art of keeping silent are more or less obvious qualities psychology is handled with deliberate hardness and cruelty the whole book does not contain one single good-natured word all this sort of thing refreshes a man who can guess the kind of recreation that is necessary after such an expenditure of goodness as is to be found in zarathustra from a theological standpoint now pay ye heed for it is but on rare occasions that i speak as a theologian it was god himself who at the end of his great work coiled himself up in the form of a serpent at the foot of the tree of knowledge it was thus that he recovered from being a god he had made everything too beautiful the devil is simply god's moment of idleness on that seventh day the genealogy of morals a polemic the three essays which constitute this genealogy are as regards expression aspiration and the art of the unexpected perhaps the most curious things that have ever been written dionysus as you know is also the god of darkness in each case the beginning is calculated to mystify it is cool scientific even ironical intentionally thrust to the fore intentionally reticent gradually less calmness prevails here and there a flash of lightning defines the horizon exceedingly unpleasant truths break upon your ears from out remote distances with a dull rumbling sound until very soon a fierce tempo is attained in which everything presses forwards at a terrible degree of tension at the end in each case amid fearful thunderclaps a new truth shines out between thick clouds the truth of the first essay is the psychology of christianity the birth of christianity out of the spirit of resentment not as is supposed out of the spirit in all its essentials a counter movement the great insurrection against the dominion of noble values the second essay contains the psychology of conscience this is not as you may believe the voice of god in man it is the instinct of cruelty which turns it inwards once it is unable to discharge itself outwardly cruelty is here exposed for the first time as one of the oldest and most indispensable elements in the foundation of culture the third essay replies to the question as to the origin of the formidable power of the ascetic ideal of the priest ideal despite the fact that this ideal is essentially detrimental that it is a will to non-entity and to decadence reply it flourished not because god was active behind the priests as is generally believed but because it was a faute de milieu from the fact that hitherto it has been the only ideal and has had no competitors for man prefers to aspire to non-entity than not to aspire at all but above all until the time of zarathustra there was no such thing as a counter ideal you have understood my meaning three decisive overtures on the part of a psychologist to a transvaluation of all values this book contains the first psychology of the priest the twilight of the idols how to philosophize with the hammer one this work which covers scarcely one hundred and fifty pages with its cheerful and fateful tone 
like a laughing demon, and the production of which occupied so few days that I hesitate to give their number, is altogether an exception among books. There is no work more rich in substance, more independent, more upsetting, more wicked. If anyone should desire to obtain a rapid sketch of how everything before my time was standing on its head, he should begin reading me in this book. That which is called idols on the title page is simply the old truth that has been believed in hitherto. In plain English, the twilight of the idols means that the old truth is on its last legs. 2. There is no reality, no ideality, which has not been touched in this book. Touched? <laughs> what a cautious euphemism! Not only the eternal idols, but also the youngest, that is to say, the most senile, modern ideas, for instance. A strong wind blows between the trees, and in all directions fall the fruit. The truths! There is a waste of an all-too-rich autumn in this book. You trip over truths. You even crush some to death. There are too many of them. Those things that you can grasp, however, are quite unquestionable. There are irrevocable decrees. I alone have the criterion of truths in my possession. I alone can decide. It would seem as if a second consciousness had grown up in me, as if the life will in me had thrown a light upon the downward path along which it has been running throughout the ages. The downward path. Hitherto, this has been called the road to truth. All obscure impulse, darkness and dismay, is at an end. The good man was precisely he who was least aware of the proper way. Translator's footnote. A witty reference to Goethe's well-known passage in the prologue to Faust. A good man, though in darkness and dismay, may still be conscious of the proper way. The words are spoken by the Lord. End translator's note. And, speaking in all earnestness, no one before me knew the proper way, the way upwards. Only after my time could men once more find hope, life tasks, and roads mapped out that lead to culture. I am the joyful harbinger of this culture. On this account alone I am also a fatality. 3. Immediately after the completion of the above-named work, and without letting even one day go by, I tackled the formidable task of the transvaluation with a supreme feeling of pride which nothing could equal. And, certain at each moment of my immortality, I cut sign after sign upon tablets of brass with the sureness of fate. The preface came into being on the 3rd of September 1888 when, after having written it down, I went out into the open that morning, I was greeted by the most beautiful day I had ever seen in the upper Egadine. Clear, glowing with colour, and presenting all the contrasts and all the intermediary gradations between ice and the south, I left Sils Maria only on the 20th of September. I had been forced to delay my departure owing to floods, and I was very soon, and for some days, the only visitor in this wonderful spot, on which by gratitude bestows the gift of an immortal name. After a journey that was full of incidents, and not without danger to life, as for instance at Como, which was flooded when I reached it in the dead of night, I got to Turin on the afternoon of the 21st. Turin is the only suitable place for me, and it shall be my home henceforward. I took the same lodgings as I had occupied in the spring, 6111, via Carlo Alberto, 
opposite the mighty Palazzo Carignano, in which Vittorio Emmanuel was born, and I had a view of the Piazzo Carlo Alberto, and above it across to the hills. Without hesitating, or allowing myself to be disturbed for a single moment, I returned to my work, only the last quarter of which had still to be written. On the 30th of September, tremendous triumph, the seventh day, the leisure of a god on the banks of the Po. Translator's footnote. There is a wonderful promenade along the banks of the Po, for which Turin is famous, and of which Nietzsche was particularly fond. End translator's note. On the same day, I wrote the preface to The Twilight of the Idols, the correction of the proofs of which provided me with recreation during the month of September. Never in my life have I experienced such an autumn nor had I ever imagined that such things were possible on earth. A Claude Lorrain extended to infinity, each day equal to the last in its wild perfection. The Case of Wagner A Musician's Problem 1. In order to do justice to this essay, a man ought to suffer from the fate of music as from an open wound. From what do I suffer when I suffer from the fate of music? From the fact that music has lost its world-transfiguring, yea-saying character, that it is decadent music, and no longer the flute of Dionysus. Supposing, however, that the fate of music be as dear to man as his own life, because joy and suffering are alike bound up with it, then he will find this pamphlet comparatively mild, and full of consideration. To be cheerful in such circumstances, and laugh good-naturedly with the others at oneself, credendo de cari severum. Translator's Note The Motto of the Case of Wagner End of Translator's Note when the verum de serre would justify every sort of hardness, is humanity itself. Who doubts that I, old artillery man that I am, would be able, if I liked, to point my heavy guns at Wagner? Everything decisive in this question I kept to myself. I have loved Wagner. After all, an attack upon a more than usually subtle unknown person, whom another would not have divined so easily, lies in the meaning and path of my life task. Oh, I have still quite a number of other unknown persons to unmask besides a cagliostro of music. Above all, I have to direct an attack against the German people, who, in matters of the spirit, grow every day more indolent, poorer in instincts, and more honest, who, with an appetite for which they are to be envied, continue to die themselves on contradictions, and gulp down faith in company with science. Christian love, together with anti-Semitism, and the will to power, to the empire, dished up with the gospel of the humble, without showing the slightest signs of indigestion. Fancy this absence of party feeling in the presence of opposites. Fancy this gastric neutrality and disinterestedness. Behold this sense of justice in the German palate, which can grant equal rights to all, which finds everything tasteful. Without a shadow of a doubt, the Germans are idealists. When I was last in Germany, I found a German taste striving to grant Wagner and the trumpeter of Sackingen equal rights. Translator's footnote, an opera by Nessler, which was all the rage in Germany twenty years ago. End translator's note. 
while I witnessed the attempts of the people of Leipzig to do honour to one of the most genuine and most German of musicians, using German here in the old sense of the word, a man who is no mere German of the empire, the master Heinrich Schultz, by founding a Liszt society, the object of which was to cultivate and spread artful, listige, church music. Translator's footnote. Unfortunately, it is impossible to render this play on the words in English. And translator's note. Without a shadow of doubt, the Germans are idealists. Two. But here, nothing shall stop me from being rude, and from telling the Germans one or two unpleasant home truths. Who else would do it if I did not? I refer to their laxity in matters historical. Not only have the Germans entirely lost the breadth of vision, which enables one to grasp the course of culture and the values of culture, not only are they one and all political, or church, puppets, but they have also actually put a ban upon this very breadth of vision. A man must first and foremost be German. He must belong to the race. Then only can he pass judgment upon all values and lack of values in history then only can he establish them. To be German is in itself an argument. Germany, Germany above all, is a principle. Translator's note, the German national song, Deutschland, Deutschland über alles, and translator's note. The Germans stand for the moral order of the universe in history, compared with the Roman Empire. They are the upholders of freedom. Compared with the 18th century, they are the restorers of morality, of the categorical imperative. There is such a thing as the writing of history according to the lights of imperial Germany. There is, I fear, anti-Semitic history. There is also history written with an eye to the court, and Herr von Tretzk is not ashamed of himself. Quite recently, an idiotic opinion in Historicus, an observation of Fischer, the Swabian athlete, since happily deceased, made the round of the German newspapers as a truth to which every German must assent. The observation was this, the Renaissance and the Reformation only together constitute a whole the aesthetic rebirth and the moral rebirth. When I listen to such things, I lose all patience, and I feel inclined, I even feel it my duty to tell the Germans, for once in a way, all that they have on their conscience. Every great crime against culture for the last four centuries lies on their conscience and always for the same reason, always owing to their bottomless cowardice in the face of reality, which is also cowardice in the face of truth, always owing to the love of falsehood, which has become almost instinctive in them, in short, idealism. It was the Germans who caused Europe to lose the fruits, the whole meaning of her last period of greatness, the period of the Renaissance. At a moment when a higher order of values, values that were noble, that said yea to life, and that guaranteed a future, had succeeded in triumphing over the opposite values, the values of degeneration, in the very seat of Christianity itself, and even in the hearts of those sitting there, Luther, that cursed monk, not only restored the church, but what was a thousand times worse, restored Christianity, and at a time, too, when it lay defeated. Christianity, the denial of the will to live, exalted to a religion. Luther was an impossible monk who, 
thanks to his own impossibility, attacked the Church, and in doing so restored it. Catholics would be perfectly justified in celebrating feasts in honour of Luther, and in producing festival plays in his honour. Translator's Note Ever since the year 1617, such plays have been produced by the Protestants of Germany. End translator's note. Luther and the rebirth of morality. May all psychology go to the devil. Without a shadow of a doubt, the Germans are idealists. On two occasions when, at the cost of enormous courage and self-control, an upright, unequivocal and perfectly scientific attitude of mind had been attained, the Germans were able to discover backstairs leading down to the old ideal again, compromises between truth and the ideal, and, in short, formulae for the right to reject science and to perpetrate falsehoods. Leibniz and Kant, these two great breaks upon the intellectual honesty of Europe, Finally, at a moment when there appeared on the bridge that spanned two centuries of decadence, a superior force of genius and will which was strong enough to consolidate Europe and to convert it into a political and economic unit, with the object of ruling the world, the Germans, with their wars of independence, robbed Europe of the significance the marvellous significance of Napoleon's life, and in doing so they laid on their conscience everything that followed, everything that exists today, this sickliness and want of reason which is most opposed to culture, and which is called nationalism, this nevrosa nationale, from which Europe is suffering acutely, this eternal subdivision of Europe into petty states with politics on a municipal scale, they have robbed Europe itself of its significance, of its reason, and have stuffed it into a cul-de-sac. Is there anyone except me who knows the way out of this cul-de-sac? Does anyone except me know of an aspiration which would be great enough to bind the peoples of Europe once more together? 3. And after all, why should I not express my suspicions? In my case too, the Germans will attempt to make a great fate give birth merely to a mouse. Up to the present, they have compromised themselves with me. I doubt whether the future will improve them. Alas, how happy I should be to prove a false prophet in this matter. My natural readers and listeners are already Russians, Scandinavians, and Frenchmen. Will they always be the same? In the history of knowledge, Germans are represented only by doubtful names. They have been able to produce only unconscious swindlers. This word applies to Fichte, Schelling, Schopenhauer, Hegel, and Schleilemacher, just as well as to Kant or Leibniz. They were all merely Schleilemachers. A translator's footnote. Schleiermacher literally means a weaver or maker of veils. End translator's note. The Germans must not have the honour of seeing the first upright intellect in the history of intellects. That intellect in which truth ultimately got the better of the fraud of four thousand years, reckoned as one with the German intellect. German intellect is my foul air. I breathe with difficulty in the neighbourhood of this psychological uncleanliness that has now become instinctive, an uncleanliness which in every word and expression betrays a German. They have never undergone a seventeenth century of hard self-examination, as the French have. A La Rochefoucauld, a Descartes, are a thousand times more upright than the very first among Germans. The latter have not yet had any psychologists. 
but psychology is almost the standard of measurement for the cleanliness or uncleanliness of a race. For if a man is not even clean, how can he be deep? The Germans are like women. You can scarcely ever fathom their depths. They haven't any, and that's the end of it. Thus they cannot even be called shallow. That which is called deep in Germany is precisely this instinctive uncleanliness towards oneself, of which I have just spoken. People refuse to be clear in regards to their own natures. Might I be allowed, perhaps, to suggest the word German as an international epithet denoting this psychological depravity? At the moment of writing, for instance, the German emperor is declaring it to be his Christian duty to liberate the slaves in Africa. Among us Europeans, then, this would be called simply German. Have the Germans ever produced even a book that had depth? They are lacking in the mere idea of what constitutes a book. I have known scholars who thought that Kant was deep. At the court of Prussia, I fear that Herr von Trisk is regarded as deep. And when I happen to praise Sandhal as a deep psychologist, I have often been compelled, in the company of German university professors, to spell his name aloud. 4. And why should I not proceed to the end? I am fond of clearing the air. It is even part of my ambition to be considered as essentially a despiser of Germans. I expressed my suspicions of the German character even at the age of six and twenty. See Thoughts Out of Season, Volume 2, pages 164 to 165. To my mind, the Germans are impossible. When I try to think of the kind of man who is opposed to me in all my instincts, my mental image takes the form of a German. The first thing I ask myself when I begin analysing a man is whether he has a feeling for distance in him, whether he sees rank, gradation and order everywhere between man and man, whether he makes distinctions, for this is what constitutes a gentleman. Otherwise, he belongs hopelessly to that open-hearted, open-minded, alas, an always very good-natured species, la canaille, but the Germans are canaille. Alas, they are so good-natured, a man lowers himself by frequenting the society of Germans. The German places everyone on an equal footing. With the exception of my intercourse with one or two artists, and above all with Richard Wagner, I cannot say that I have spent one pleasant hour with Germans. Suppose, for one moment, that the profoundest spirit of all ages were to appear among Germans, then one of the saviours of the capital would be sure to arise and declare that his own ugly soul was just as great. I can no longer abide this race, with which a man is always in bad company, which has no idea of nuances. Woe to me! I am a nuance! And which has not esprit in its feet, and cannot even walk with all. In short, the Germans have no feet at all. They simply have legs. The Germans have not the faintest idea of how vulgar they are. But this in itself is the acme of vulgarity. They are not even ashamed of being merely Germans. They will have their say in everything. They regard themselves as fit to decide all questions. I even fear they have decided about me. My whole life is essentially a proof of this remark. In vain have I sought among them for a sign of tact and delicacy towards myself. Among Jews I did indeed find it, but not among Germans. I am so constituted as to be gentle, 
and kindly to everyone. I have the right not to draw distinctions. But this does not prevent my eyes from being open. I accept no one, and least of all my friends. I only trust that this has not prejudiced my reputation for humanity among them. There are five or six things which I have always made points of honour, albeit the truth remains that, for many years, I have considered almost every letter that has reached me as a piece of cynicism. There is more cynicism in an attitude of goodwill towards me than any sort of hatred. I tell every friend to his face that he has never thought it worth his while to study any one of my writings. From the slightest hints, I gather that they do not even know what lies hidden in my books. And with regard to even to my Zarathustra, which of my friends would have seen more in it than a piece of unwarrantable, though fortunately harmless, arrogance? Ten years have elapsed, and no one has yet felt it a duty to his conscience to defend my name against the absurd silence beneath which it has been entombed. It was a foreigner, a Dane, who first showed sufficient keenness of instinct and courage to do this, and who protested indignantly against my so-called friends. At what German university today would such lectures on my philosophy be possible as those which Dr. Brandes delivered last spring in Copenhagen, thus proving once more his right to the title psychologist? For my part, these things have never caused me any pain. That which is necessary does not offend me. Amor fati is the core of my nature. This, however, does not alter the fact that I love irony, and even world-historic irony. And thus, about two years before hurling the destructive thunderbolt of the transvaluation, which will send the whole of civilization into convulsions, I sent my case of Wagner out into the world. The Germans were given the chance of blundering and immortalizing their stupidity once more on my account, and they still have just enough time to do it in. And have they fallen in with my plans? Admirably, my dear Germans, allow me to congratulate you. End of Why I Write Such Excellent Books, Part 3 Chapter 4 of Ecce Homo by Friedrich Nietzsche Translated by Antony M. Ludovici Why I am a fatality I know my destiny. There will come a day when my name will recall the memory of something formidable. A crisis the like of which has never been known on earth the memory of the most profound clash of consciences, and the passing of a sentence upon all that which theretofore had been believed, exacted, and hallowed. I am not a man. I am dynamite. And with it all, there is naught of the founder of a religion in me. Religions are matters for the mob. After coming in contact with a religious man, I always feel that I must wash my hands. I require no believers. It is my opinion that I am too full of malice to believe even in myself. I never address myself to masses. I am horribly frightened that one day I shall be pronounced holy. You will understand why I published this book beforehand. It is to prevent people from wronging me. I refuse to be a saint. I would rather be a clown. Maybe I am a clown. And I am notwithstanding. Or rather, not notwithstanding. 
the mouthpiece of truth. For nothing more blown out with falsehood has ever existed than a saint. But my truth is terrible. For hitherto lies have been called truth. The transvaluation of all values. This is my formula for mankind's greatest step towards coming to its senses. A step which in me became flesh and genius. My destiny ordained that I should be the first decent human being, and that I should feel myself opposed to the falsehood of millenniums. I was the first to discover truth, and for the simple reason that I was the first who became conscious of falsehood as falsehood. That is to say, I smelt it as such. My genius resides in my nostrils. I contradict as no one has contradicted hitherto, and am nevertheless the reverse of a negative spirit. I am the harbinger of joy, the like of which has never existed before. I have discovered tasks of such lofty greatness that, until my time, no one had any idea of such things. Mankind can begin to have fresh hopes only now that I have lived. Thus, I am necessarily a man of fate. For when truth enters the lists against the falsehood of ages, shocks are bound to ensue, and a spell of earthquakes, followed by the transposition of hills and valleys, such as the world has never yet imagined even in its dreams. The concept politics then becomes elevated entirely to the sphere of spiritual warfare. All the mighty realms of the ancient order of society are blown into space, for they are all based on falsehood. There will be wars, the like of which have never been seen on earth before. Only from my time and after me will politics on a large scale exist on earth. 2. If you should require a formula for a destiny of this kind that has taken human form, you will find it in my Zarathustra. And he who would be a creator in good and evil, verily, he must first be a destroyer, and break values into pieces. Thus the greatest evil belongeth unto the greatest good, but this is the creative good. I am by far the most terrible man that has ever existed. But this does not alter the fact that I shall become the most beneficent. I know the joy of annihilation to a degree which is commensurate with my power to annihilate. In both cases, I obey my Dionysian nature, which knows not how to separate the negative deed from the saying of yea. I am the first immoralist, and in this sense, I am essentially the annihilator. 3. People never asked me, as they should have done, what the name of Zarathustra precisely meant in my mouth, in the mouth of the first immoralist. For that which distinguishes this Persian from all others in the past is the very fact that he was the exact reverse of an immoralist. Zarathustra was the first to see, in the struggle between good and evil, the essential wheel in the working of things. The translation of morality into the realm of metaphysics, as force, cause, end in itself, is his work. But the very question suggests its own answer. Zarathustra created this most pretentious of all errors, morality. Therefore, he must be the first to expose it. Not only because he has had longer 
and greater experience of the subject than any other thinker. All history is indeed the experimental refutation of the theory of the so-called moral order of things. But because of the most important fact that Zarathustra was the most truthful of thinkers, in his teaching alone is truthfulness upheld as the highest virtue, that is to say, as the reverse of the cowardice of the idealist who takes to his heels at the sight of reality. Zarathustra has more pluck in his body than all other thinkers put together. To tell the truth and to aim straight, that is the first Persian virtue. Have I made myself clear? The overcoming of morality by itself, through truthfulness, the moralist's overcoming of himself in his opposite, in me. That is what the name Zarathustra means in my mouth. 4. In reality, two negations are involved in my title immoralist. I first of all deny the type of man that has hitherto been regarded as the highest, the good, the kind, and the charitable. And I also deny that kind of morality which has become recognized and paramount as morality in itself. I speak of the morality of decadence, or, to use a still cruder term, Christian morality. I would agree to the second of the two negations being regarded as the more decisive, for, reckoned as a whole, the overestimation of goodness and kindness seems to me already a consequence of decadence, a symptom of weakness, and incompatible with any ascending and yea-saying life. Negation and annihilation are inseparable from a yea-saying attitude towards life. Let me halt for a moment at the question of the psychology of the good man. In order to appraise the value of a certain type of man, the cost of his maintenance must be calculated and the condition of his existence must be known. The condition of the existence of the good is falsehood, or, otherwise expressed, the refusal at any price to see how reality is actually constituted. The refusal to see that this reality is not so constituted as always to be stimulating beneficent instincts and still less, so as to suffer at all moments the intrusion of ignorant and good-natured hands. To consider distress of all kinds as an objection, as something which must be done away with, is the greatest nonsense on earth. Generally speaking, it is nonsense of the most disastrous sort, fatal in its stupidity almost as mad as the will to abolish bad weather, out of pity for the poor, so to speak. In the great economy of the whole universe, the terrors of reality, in the passions, in the desires, in the will to power, are incalculably more necessary than that form of petty happiness which is called goodness. It is even needful to practice leniency in order so much as to allow the latter a place at all, seeing that it is based upon a falsification of the instincts. I shall have an excellent opportunity of showing the incalculable calamitous consequences to the whole of history of the credo of optimism, this monstrous offspring of the hominis optimi. Zarathustra, the first who recognized that the optimist 
is just as degenerate as the pessimist though perhaps more detrimental says good men never speak the truth false shores and false harbours were ye taught by the good in the lies of the good were ye born and bred through the good everything hath become false and crooked from the roots translator's note needless to say this is nietzsche and no longer the persian and translator's note fortunately the world is not built merely upon those instincts which would secure to the good-natured herd animal his paltry happiness to desire everybody to become a good man a gregarious animal a blue-eyed benevolent beautiful soul or as herbert spencer wished a creature of altruism would mean robbing existence of its greatest character castrating man and reducing humanity to a sort of wretched chinadom and this some have tried to do it is precisely this that men called morality in this sense zarathustra calls the good now the last man and anon the beginning of the end and above all he considers them as the most detrimental kind of men because they secure their existence at the cost of truth and at the cost of the future the good they cannot create they are ever the beginning of the end they crucify him who writeth new values on new tables they sacrifice unto themselves the future they crucify the whole future of humanity the good they are ever the beginning of the end and whatever harm the slanderers of the world may do the harm of the good is the most calamitous of all harm five zarathustra as the first psychologist of the good man is perforce the friend of the evil man when a degenerate kind of man has succeeded to the highest rank among the human species his position must have been gained at the cost of the reverse type at the cost of the strong man who is certain of life when the gregarious animal stands in the glorious rays of the purest virtue the exceptional man must be degraded to the rank of evil if falsehood insists at all costs on claiming the word truth for its own particular standpoint the really truthful man must be sought out among the despised zarathustra allows of no doubt here he says it was precisely the knowledge of the good and of the best which inspired his absolute horror of men and it was out of this feeling of repulsion that he grew the wings which allowed him to soar into remote futures he does not conceal the fact that his type of man is one which is relatively superhuman especially as opposed to the good man and that the good and the just would regard his superman as the devil ye higher men on whom my gaze now falls this is the doubt that ye wake in my breast and this is my secret laughter methinks ye would call my superman the devil so strange are ye in your souls to all that is great that the superman would be terrible in your eyes for his goodness it is from this passage and from no other that you must set out to understand 
the goal to which Zarathustra aspires. The kind of man that he conceives sees reality as it is. He is strong enough for this. He is not estranged or far removed from it. He is that reality himself. In his own nature can be found all the terrible and questionable character of reality. Only thus can man have greatness. <clears throat> 6. But I have chosen the title of Immoralist as a surname and as a badge of honour in yet another sense. I am very proud to possess this name which distinguishes me from all the rest of mankind. No one hitherto has felt Christian morality beneath him. To that end there were needed height, a remoteness of vision, and an abysmal psychological depth, not believed to be possible hitherto. Up to the present, Christian morality has been the circe of all thinkers. They stood at her service. What man before my time has descended into the underground caverns from out of which the poisonous fumes of this ideal, of the slandering of the world, burst forth? What man had even dared to suppose that they were underground caverns? Was a single one of all the philosophers who preceded me a psychologist at all? and not the very reverse of a psychologist, that is to say, a superior swindler, an idealist? Before my time, there was no psychology. To be the first in this new realm may amount to a curse. At all events, it is a fatality. For one is also the first to despise. My danger is the loathing of mankind. 7. Have you understood me? That which defines me, that which makes me stand apart from the whole of the rest of humanity, is the fact that I unmasked Christian morality. For this reason, I was in need of a word which conveyed the idea of a challenge to everybody. Not to have awakened to these discoveries before, struck me as being the sign of the greatest uncleanliness that mankind has on his conscience. As self-deception become instinctive, as the fundamental will to be blind to every phenomenon, all causes tree, and all reality. In fact, as an almost criminal fraud in Sukilokigis. Blindness in regard to Christianity is the essence of criminality, for it is the crime against life. Ages and peoples, the first as well as the last, philosophers and old women, with the exception of five or six moments in history, and of myself, a seventh, are all alike in this. Hitherto the Christian has been the moral being, a peerless oddity, and as a moral being, he was more absurd, more vain, more thoughtless, and a greater disadvantage to himself than the greatest despiser of humanity could have deemed possible. Christian morality is the most malignant form of all falsehood. The actual circe of humanity, that which has corrupted mankind. It is not error as error which infuriates me at the sight of this spectacle. It is not the millenniums of absence of goodwill, of discipline, of decency, 
and of bravery in spiritual things, which betrays itself in the triumph of Christianity. It is rather the absence of nature. It is the perfectly ghastly fact that anti-nature itself received the highest honours as morality and as law and remain suspended over man as the categorical imperative. Fancy blundering in this way, not as an individual, not as a people, but as a whole species, as humanity. To teach the contempt of all the principal instincts of life, to posit falsely the existence of a soul, of a spirit, in order to be able to defy the body, to spread the feeling that there was something impure in the very first prequisite of life, in sex, to seek the principle of evil in the profound need of growth and expansion, that is to say, in severe self-love, the term itself is slanderous, and conversely, to see a higher moral value. But what am I talking about? I mean the moral value per se in the typical signs of decline, in the antagonism of the instincts, in selflessness, in the loss of ballast, in the suppression of the personal element, and in love of one's neighbor. Neighbor-itis? What? Is humanity itself in a state of degeneration? Has it always been in this state? One thing is certain, that ye are taught only the values of decadence as the highest values. The morality of self-renunciation is essentially the morality of degeneration. The fact, I am going to the dogs, is translated into the imperative ye shall all go to the dogs and not only into the imperative this morality of self-renunciation which is the only kind of morality that has been taught hitherto betrays the will to non-entity it denies life to the very roots there still remains the possibility that it is not mankind that is in a state of degeneration but only that parasitical kind of man, the priest, who, by means of morality and lies, has climbed up to his position of determinator of values, who divined in Christian morality his road to power. And, to tell the truth, this is my opinion. The teachers and the leaders of mankind, including the theologians, have been, every one of them, decadents. Hence, the transvaluation of all values into a hostility towards life. Hence, morality. The definition of morality. Morality is the idiosyncrasy of decadence, actuated by a desire to avenge themselves with success upon life. I attach great value to this definition. 8. Have you understood me? I have not uttered a single word, which I have not already said five years ago, through my mouthpiece, Zarathustra. The unmasking of Christian morality is an event which is unequalled in history. It is a real catastrophe. The man who throws light upon it is a force majeure, a fatality. He breaks the history of man into two. Time is reckoned up before him and after him. The lightning flash of truth struck precisely that which theretofore had stood highest. He who understands what was destroyed by that flash should look to see whether he still holds anything in his hands. Everything, which until then was called truth, has been revealed as the most detrimental, most spiteful, and most subterranean form of life. The holy pretext, which was the 
improvement of man has been recognized as a ruse for draining life of its energy and of its blood morality conceived as vampirism the man who unmasks morality has also unmasked the worthlessness of the values in which men either believe or have believed he no longer sees anything to be revered in the most venerable men even in the types of men that have been pronounced holy all he can see in them is the most fatal kind of abortions fatal because they fascinate the concept god was invented as the opposite of the concept life everything detrimental poisonous and slanderous and all deadly hostility to life was bound together in one horrible unit in him the concepts beyond and true world were invented in order to depreciate the only world that exists in order that no goal or aim no sense or task might be left to earthly reality the concepts soul spirit and last of all the concept immortal soul were invented in order to throw contempt on the body in order to make it sick and holy in order to cultivate an attitude of appalling levity towards all things in life which deserve to be treated seriously i e the questions of nutrition and habitation of intellectual diet the treatment of the sick cleanliness and weather instead of health we find the salvation of the soul that is to say a folie circulaire fluctuating between convulsions and penitence and the hysteria of redemption the concept sin together with the torture instrument appertaining to it which is the concept free will was invented in order to confuse and muddle our instincts and to render the mistrust of them man's second nature in the concepts disinterestedness and self-denial the actual signs of decadence are to be found the allurement of that which is detrimental the inability to discover one's own advantage and self-destruction are made into absolute qualities into the duty the holiness and the divinity of man finally to keep the worst to the last by the notion of the good man all that is favored which is weak ill botched and sick in itself which ought to be wiped out the law of selection is thwarted an ideal is made out of opposition to the proud well-constituted man to him who says yea to life to him who is certain of the future and who guarantees the future this man is henceforth called the evil one and all this was believed in as morality écrasé l'infâme nine have you understood me dionysus versus christ end of why i am a fatality recording by tim sherman chase www dot s h e e r m a n hyphen chase dot org dot u k
End of Eke Homo by Friedrich Nietzsche. Translated by Anthony M. Ludovici.